Uh, oh, saying you are not Marian. <laughs> Hi, Rosa. Hi. Hi. Hi, Rosa. How are you? Fine. Thanks. Excellent to see you. Thank you very much. Nice to see you here. Hi, Hamal. Welcome. Bienvenue. Hello, everybody. Uh, Hello. <clears throat> this nice you day. have more books than the rest of the people. Really? <laughs> really? You have many books. <laughs> and when I people see me... You are not Maria. Hi, Maria. You know, Hello, yeah. Maria. Thanks. Excellent. I, I listen. Thank you very much. Nice to see you here. Ah, hello, Hi, Olivia. Hello. Welcome. Bienvenue. If you hello, put everybody. all your cameras, hello. I take a picture, okay? <laughs> nice you have more Open your cameras and I take a picture of really? all of you. Really? You have many books. <laughs> and when I... People see me... Hello, Maria. Hello, Maria. Hello. Thank you very much. Nice to see you here. Very nice to see all of you. Lovely. If you put all your cameras, I'll take a picture, okay? Open cameras. Open your cameras. All the people, open cameras. All of you. I am taking yes, I'm... pictures. Yeah. Bienvenido, Ricardo. Hello, Maria. Hello. 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 Hello, Hello. 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 Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. 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 It's because I am uh, trying. I have. I am into devices to check. So, please put your names in the chat just to have a register of uh, the people which is assisting the the meeting. Uh, everything is fine, Rosa. We are transmitting in direct by YouTube right now. Excellent. Bravo. <laughs> well, fine, then yeah. uh, we begin the session. Do you agree? Yes, yes. I, I to... suggest to start because it's almost uh, 8.40. So. Do you want that I share the PowerPoint or is better? You can. You? No, no, no. Share you no. because you have your, your own times. For the speech, okay. so share the screen. Okay. Well, uh, uh, thank you very much to everybody. We are very happy uh, that you participate in this meeting uh, about the new project of uh, NASA UNESCO. This is a special project, it's a messier challenge. And uh, we hope that this year uh, there were many, many participants. They uh, will be many, many participants because last year there were many of them in the Meteorites uh, project. It was a really success and we hope to repeat again. And uh, well, I don't know if... Uh, Beatriz, do you want to say something? No, just welcome everyone. And um, well, I hope uh, this new year with the new uh, challenge will be part of uh, our 
big results for for the end of the year remember that this um this um, uh, invitation uh, this is the start of the invitation uh, to make um, a special activity along the year um we will um, well, well, we will uh, say something at the end about the, the closing ceremony. But, um, well, just uh, welcome, and uh, I hope you enjoy the presentations today. Thank you very much. Well, uh, you know that, uh, oh, sorry, I have a problem. Well, uh, you know that uh, we uh, decided this year a new project is a messier challenge uh, because we uh, would like to promote that students observe the sky, but not only stars, a little bit more, some uh, special objects, some diffuse objects that they can in some way discover the, the special, special sky and the special objects that we can observe. If we take enough time, okay. Then uh, we have a list of uh, several objects. Uh, you know that the Messier is a very complete catalog, and of course there are many objects that you need uh, some astronomical devices in order to observe. Then we believe that the majority of the schools don't have them. Then the idea was that um, to open uh, the possibility to observe some of the Messier objects that could be very easy, maybe without any device it's possible to observe, to observe, or at most with binoculars. But we thought that we have one problem if we use only the Messier objects, that they are very well. But uh, you know that uh, the majority of them, they are visible in the North Hemisphere. Then we want to open to all the uh, students in all the world. That this was the reason that we decided to introduce some objects more in the Southern Hemisphere. Then, uh, Beatriz, uh, I, I think that you call <laughs> to mention something about this, maybe? No, 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 go on. No? Okay. Then uh, we put here several of them that it is possible to observe uh, without any special device. And uh, in order to participate, uh, we only want that the students enjoy, try to find the location of these objects. And after uh, they can uh, maybe take a picture or uh, it is not possible, they can produce themselves uh, a drawing. Uh, the creativity of uh, our students sure that it is very, very important and they could do it an, an excellent work in this way. Okay. Then, uh, in order to make observations, uh, it is necessary to uh, take in account uh, several points. We uh, believe that it is very important uh, to show it's a good place without light pollution, uh, to choose a good date without uh, the light of the moon, because this is in some way um, uh, also a, a pollution, because uh, it is impossible to observe some diffuse uh, objects close to full moon. And, uh, well, it depends on the temperature it is necessary to take a warm uh, clothing. Also, uh, it is uh, good to have a map or something that help us to find the objects. And uh, also it is very important if you have uh, one planisphere uh, and uh, one red flash uh, light, because uh, if we use uh, some other kind of lamps, for instance, the torch of our mobile, it is not good for our eyes. No, in order to observe, you need maybe half an uh, well, twenty minutes to to observe uh, with uh, fiability. Then uh, also it could be a help if you have the possibility. 
to study before the situation of the object with a several software special for it, okay? In order to use binoculars, the best um, kind of binoculars they are that ma magnifies uh, the object uh, and uh, have a good aperture. Uh, in some cases, the objects are very, very, how do you say, not very brilliant, and then it is necessary uh, don't increase a lot, don't magnify a lot, because in this case, we lost uh, light. And uh, then a good solution for observers, for amateurs in astronomy, it could be uh, 7 per 50. This is not uh, so big, big magnify, and the aperture is not uh, so small. And then uh, the very important thing is that you use the binoculars with a tripod, or if you don't have it, you can sit in one chair with the position that we show in this drawing. It is very important to obtain stability. When you take pictures, it's exactly the same. You need a tripod because you need to subject or tripod, another kind of support in order that you put in a good way your mobile if you want to take a picture. Well, I have here uh, uh, an example of one drawing and one photo of players. Uh, of course, uh, all uh, activities, all possibilities are welcome for us because uh, we essentially are interested in promoting promoting observation and observation of other uh, bodies, not only dot points, okay? Well, uh, this is, you know, that every year you have to send to us uh, this information. Uh, we, this year, add to the teacher's name, the student's names, because there are many of you that send uh, to us uh, uh, the names of your students, you know that in all the cases we prepare certification for all of you, all the teachers or the students that participate in this, um, in this activity. And uh, also uh, it is important to give uh, more details about this place where you are doing the observation and also uh, the time. It is important when students make observation, they write information about what they are doing. Send to us with the photo or the drawing and several pictures more about the students working because they are very nice in a website to have the possibility to see images. Ah, but this is an special thing for this year. Uh, normally, you only send the information what you are doing. But in this case, we are uh, interested to know uh, what are your favorite uh, objects. Uh, what do you like that uh, if we prepare, not the Messier catalog, one special catalog only for schools, uh, what could be the object that we should put in this catalog, okay? Then this is the list of the proposals. Of course, you are open to add other objects, all the messier objects that you want, uh, but also in other areas that they are not included in this catalog, okay? Then uh, you can write here more names that other objects, and uh, in this you can both uh, this yes or this other not, or, or I don't know. Uh, you decide with all the freedom that you can imagine, okay? Then, um, as you know, uh, we begin now for this project and we will finish in the uh, September equinox, okay? Then uh, the final idea that I, or the final thing that I would like to mention, that is the, the book, that we uh, are finished about the uh, previous, the previous uh, NASA UNESCO project about the micro meteorites, and then mm, this book includes many photos that the materials that you send to us, many photos of your excellent 
uh, excellent objects, that your excellent micro V theories that you uh, sent to us. And uh, this uh, book will be uh, in our website next week. Not yet, not now, but next week will be there, okay? And I uh, email you to all of you one uh, circular with the link, the concrete link of this uh, book that you can uh, revise with your students because you can see many of your students and many of your photos in, uh, in this case, okay? Then I, I hope that uh, you enjoy very much this year, such as the last one. And uh, I think this is the summary about our project for this year. And all your suggestions are well, well accepted. Okay, thank you. I don't know if we have any questions maybe or I no? cannot no, see no. any raised hand, so any for a moment. Comments? So may no I say question. something? Oh, yes, Jamal, go. Sorry, I didn't have time to to, to raise my hand, but um, <laughs> it's okay. to speak out. We are not so many after all. Yeah. Okay, just to keep the the conversation going, actually, uh, you mentioned, we may have mentioned that in uh, in the passing, but uh, uh, what are the, what are the, the, the the fate or the or the luck of the people living in the southern hemisphere since you said and we know all that messi has done his work mostly in the from the northern hemisphere and so most of the objects are not visible at their latitude so you mentioned there's some extra object mm -hmm. you added but how always uh, i mean uh, uh, what it's, it's a Miss, messi extended list otherwise the, we'll just clarify i was not i didn't follow too much what you say, you might have answered my question already, but how no, do you go well, about those people in the southern hemisphere and the, what extra catalogs do we, are we are going to, 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 to propose to them? Thank you. Uh, I, will, I will give a short uh, contribution in a few minutes. So I will speak about uh, the objects we add to this uh, list to observe uh, from the south. So uh, it's not complete, of course, because we cannot put a lot of objects, because if not, uh, you never will reach the, the full list. But I will explain why we include some special objects from the South in a, in a contribution. So I believe we will answer your question in a, in a minute. OK? OK? Thank you. Thank you for your comment. And of course, uh, the specialist in the southern sky is Beatrice for us. <laughs> okay. we, will, we will explain why some objects, um, well, why we choose that. And um, yes, we need uh, to, to include some, uh, some special uh, objects because, as you said, Messi catalog is, uh, um, does not cover the full sky. I know. Okay. I know. But in any case, I think that uh, it is good to mention that uh, we have uh, here uh, one person from the observatory of the Big Dimidi, Frederic Pito, that uh, will introduce the Messier catalog because uh, we believe that it was a very special, a special, uh, um, a special catalog in the history of astronomy, and we want to mention, especially in this case, okay? It was our, in some way, our first idea, and our, uh, we decided to create this project uh, thinking in the Messian catalog, and after we had other, uh, other objects, of course, because it was very, in some way, uh, local, no? Well, uh, I would like to begin with my speech. Uh, I will talk about uh, leap year because, as you know, uh, we uh, begin with um, with uh, this project uh, last one moment because I would like to change the PowerPoint uh, last February twenty nine. Okay, then well. Uh, this was um, 
one idea that uh, we have, uh, especially this year, because you know that normally the NASA UNESCO project begins always in the March equinox and finishes in September equinox. But uh, this 2024 is a leap year, and uh, we decided that it could be a good idea to use the February 29th uh, as a preliminary launch uh, of this um, NASA UNESCO project. And uh, I would like to here summarize very briefly uh, the uh, reason of this February 29th. Mm, uh, really, uh, we begin to think about the, what is the, the concept, and we begin with the name of this kind of special years. Lib year is in English, but in many uh, Latin, Latin countries, uh, the countries where we talk uh, a language that is a consequence of the Roman Empire, then we use a different name for it. Uh, we use Año Bisiesto, for instance, in Spain, but a similar thing with the same rise in many of our uh, languages. Then um, the origin of the first was the concept of jump for English family, but for Latin family, is absolutely different. The origin is from uh, from a concept from uh, the change of the calendar during the Roman period. Okay, then uh, in this case, uh, we would like to talk a little bit about the calendar. Okay, because all the all the world, all the countries, we are using the same calendar in some way. Then uh, the calendar that we use normally, ordinary in our life, is the Gregorian calendar. And uh, this Gregorian calendar has 365 days. And uh, this calendar is based in the solar year, then, uh, or tropical year. Then uh, the time that uh, the Earth needs to complete a revolution around the sun is 365 days, but a little bit more with a decimal uh, of, uh, differ of a day. No? Then uh, this is more than 365. Then uh, we have to consider one calendar according with this, and uh, the difference is uh, this uh, 0 0.242189 days uh, every year. Then uh, a possible solution is to add an extra day every four days, that is to say 0 0.25. But this is too much, but well, it is not so bad. And then we have three years of 365 days, and after one extra special year with 366 days. And this is the reason that normally we have 28 days in February, but for instance, this year we have 29. Well, uh, if we divide, uh, sorry, I think that I lost one. Uh, if we divide the 365, there is one mistake here, or what, 365 per seven, we obtain a rest of only one day, okay? And then this is the reason that, uh, for instance, the 23 of March in 2020 was Monday. In 2021 was one day more in the week, that is to say Tuesday. In 2022 was one day more, Wednesday. In 2023, one day more, thousand. And every year we increase one day, one day, one day. But this year, for instance, 2024, this year we add 
two, not only one, two, because if we divide 366 per seven, we obtain a rest of two days. Then in this case, it's not Friday, it's Saturday. Today is Saturday, it's not Friday. Then uh, the year that uh, we have one extra, extra uh, day, then we have one jump that the continuity that I mentioned before, okay? That this jump is that introduce the name of the leap year because it's the year of a special jump, okay? But this is very clear, I think, and very simple. But in the Latin, uh, Latin uh, languages, the history is very, very different. But in this moment is the reason that we have the calendar that practically all the countries were using. This calendar begins with the Roman Empire, with the period of the Roman um, time. And the original, uh, the original uh, calendar that they use, uh, for instance, uh, in the eighth century before Christ, uh, the Roman calendar has only 10 months. The name of the months were the different uh, Roman divinities. And this calendar has only 304 days. Uh, the first name of the months are different divinities. And when they finish the divinities, they begin to put the names of the, the order of the uh, month, uh, the month uh, uh, seven or the month eight and nine, and finally December is the month 10, okay? Well, after they uh, need to include two months more because 304 uh, years was not good. And they include January and February. <coughs> February was the the month that have less days in order to adapt with the uh, the movement of the year <coughs> and the movement of the earth around the sun. Then the reason uh, that February was a very special special month was because it was used in order to adapt with a political situation, not astronomical. The reason that changed the days in, in, in February was not an astronomical reason. The criteria was, depending if they have one election, one votation, they increase the number of days, of, of days sorry, or uh, if they have to pay, for instance, the, the militars, the soldiers, the legionaries, uh, they don't have enough money, they put, uh, 20, 30 days more, doesn't matter because they they don't have to pay if don't finish February. Then uh, finally, the situation was absolutely crazy. Uh, it was not according with the reality of the seasons. Then uh, normally the, the process of the, the, the calendar begins in January and uh, in the century five or four before Christ, normally the first month in the year was considered January. But uh, finally, in the 46 before Christ, Julius Caesar decided to uh, use a new calendar about 365.25 days distributed in 12 months, and the months have 21, uh, sorry, 31, 30, 31, 30 alternative, okay? Then uh, the extra day that was necessary to include every four, for, because we have the decimal of the 0 0.25, this extra day was introduced Exactly, in February, it was the special month with all the big problems. And then with this, they have one calendar, not so bad, 365.25 was more or less very good. 
And uh, they decide uh, after this uh, change, several years after that, to uh, to put the name of uh, the divinities. In this case, uh, Julius Caesar was uh, uh, divinized. He was a god, and also Augustus. And they decide to put the name of uh, one month to each one of them. Okay, but if they put hours that have 31 days to the <clears throat> previous imperator, then it was not possible uh, that Julius Caesar uh, was only 30 days because this was one day, one month of each one, no? 30, 31, 30, 31. Now, <clears throat> in this situation, they decide to change and to put Julius with 31 days again and then introduce only a new one change, okay? But well, finally, the month, the name of the month are according now, and after uh, the month of August, we continue with September, October, November, and December. There are the names of the religious calendar previous to the change of uh, Julius calendar. Well, and then uh, when appears the name that we use in our countries, Año Bisiesto and others uh, Latin? Well, uh, it is a consequence of the, uh, the Latin name of this extra day. It was Bis Sextus Dies Ante Calendas Marti. That is to say, translated, the repeated day of the sixth day before the first day of the month of March. This was the translation of the concept. Well, uh, this additional uh, day uh, introduced by uh, Julius Caesar was uh, a day uh, sandwiched between two, between the 23 and the 24th of February. And they put uh, 23 bits, uh, uh, 23 extra. Uh, and uh, the name of calendars is because uh, the, uh, the Roman uh, don't use numerals for the days of the, of, the, of the week. And they use, depending on the position in the month, the names of calendars, nonus, and idus. And then, uh, well, in any case, the name was the repeated day of the 23 of February, that it is before the calendars of uh, March. Well, uh, in any case, uh, this was not a fantastic uh, situation, and it was necessary to modify again. It was uh, a decision or one... Uh, uh, the person that coordinated this was a pope, uh, Gregory XIII, in uh, 1582, that decided to move the extra day uh, to the end of February, okay? Not in the middle of 23 and 24, no. They put at the end of uh, February. And then we normally finish February and 28, but every four years in 29. Okay, but in order to correct uh, the difference between the reality and the uh, 365.25, this difference, it was important. And uh, in uh, the 16th century, in 1582, the Pope decided to uh, eliminate, to delete uh, 10 days to all the humanity. And then after the uh, the day uh, <clears throat> that five, uh, uh, it would be a, a day of uh, 15 uh, because uh, it was necessary to, uh, to control the difference between uh, one and the other one. We have to lose 10 uh, days. And uh, how to can do it? Then the idea was that to um, eliminate some uh, leap years 
and they do it in order to uh, every four centuries they eliminate three leap days and with this was enough and then uh, the idea is that all the years that finish in zero zero and they are divisible by 400 such as uh, 1600 uh, zero, zero, and 2000, zero, zero, they was uh, not uh, leap years, okay? And with all of this, there are some small mistakes, but well, it is only uh, some seconds that the International Bureau of uh, Weight and Measures, uh, they correct uh, this difference of uh, small seconds, okay? Well, uh, this change uh, was uh, very fantastic because uh, introduced some mistakes in our life, in the history of our countries. Uh, for instance, uh, the Gregorian calendar was immediately adopted by Spain, by many territories of Spain in Italy, in Portugal, also was accepted in America. It was adopted a little bit later, but not very late, in France, in Poland, in Germany, in many countries. But, uh, for instance, in UK, it was accepted uh, several centuries after that, in uh, 1752. In this moment, they have not 10 days of difference, they have 11 days of difference, okay? And finally, in the 20th century, it was accepted for all the world. But there are some special and funny situations. Then, uh, for instance, uh, there are uh, one special day that was, uh, was created for UNESCO. UNESCO proposed the April 23rd of the World Book Day. And uh, because they uh, celebrate in some way, that was the day that died William Shakespeare, Miguel de Cervantes, and the Inca Garcilaso de la Vega, and many other uh, authors. But uh, the real situation that this day, uh, in 1616, was only the day that uh, died really Garcilaso. Garcilaso was a Peru, uh, Britain, very important. And uh, also, it looks that William Shakespeare died the same day. Really, the name of the day is the same, is the April 23rd, 1616. But uh, in the Julian calendar, not in the Gregorian calendar, then really, if we compare in the Gregorian calendar, uh, William Shakespeare died in May 3rd. Then it's not the same day. And, uh, but in many documents appears the 23 April 1616. And it's the same with Cervantes. Also appears in many documents that died in 20, 23 April. But in this uh, period, it was a normal habit, uh, custom in Spain that when the people died in 22, they put uh, or they certificate that was died the next day. And that is to say the 23 April. Then really, this World Book Day of UNESCO uh, is not the same day for all these uh, well now uh, rated authors but uh, well in any case I think it is a very interesting uh, suggestion and uh, for instance in my country is very recommended and all the Spanish people many Spanish people try to buy a book this is a special day okay and then uh, this uh, year I hope that you remember on April 23rd, that is, is this special day, and you buy a book, at least, okay? Then I don't know if you have any questions for me after this speech. Beatriz? I cannot see any any 
uh, no rise down. But uh, well, I invite uh, all the people to to make the questions if you have any question. You need to um, uh, um, turn off the microphones because we maintain all mute for the <clears throat> for the presentations. Well, it seems all the people. I would like to hello. give. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Oh, this yes. is Hello, Hakim. Oh, yeah. Welcome. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Rose, uh, this is a very interesting talk. Uh, and I think uh, we seldomly hear about this uh, explanation about leap year 2024. So I just wonder, do you, uh, uh, are you aware of any ethnical or uh, some, something like cultural uh, well, uh, event that celebrate the leap year in particular in Europe? Are there any? Well well, uh, no especially, no especially. Mm -hmm. uh, normally, people knows that people don't know what is the reason, and this was the origin of this this presentation. But uh, it is very common to know, and really, uh, we know the different kind of calendars. The Julius yeah. calendar. This is more or less common for schools. They explain about this. They explain also about the Gregorian calendar. And um, many students know this, uh, how do you say, this special or curious uh, situation that uh, many people say that Shakespeare and Cervantes, they die on the same day, and really they didn't do it, okay? Mm -hmm. And there are many other anecdotes, but there are maybe more local. Um, yeah that there are uh, some, uh, for instance, we have one person, it was very uh, in the central of the religious, the Catholic religion was a very important person that mm. died on five and uh, was to the cemetery on 15. And then people say, oh, oh, it's a miracle. No, no, it's only to change the calendar. <laughs> the yeah, right. But it is very special, mm. how do you say? A situation that is culture. And I think it is good that the people know that astronomy is part of our life and part yes, right. of our culture. It was one pope that decided to surprise, surprise, eliminate, to cut 10 days to the humanity. <laughs> this is so important. No? Yes, <laughs> yes. Then, uh, this kind of anecdotes that they are very funny for students, they enjoy very much. No, because they know a little bit more than the rest of the people. And probably when they are arrived from home, they come in family. Mm. Yeah. And this, I think, is positive because astronomy is part of our life. And I think it is good that the people know that. Okay. I agree. Jamal? You, you are mute, Jamal. Okay. Yes, yes. It's me again. Thank you. It's a very nice talk, Rosa. Like usual, you. all your talks and especially all your presentations are very fine. I mean, PowerPoints uh, are, are, are very powerful in making very good PowerPoints. <laughs> so I my will comment... put in, I will put in the in in the website of NASA, but I I discovered that there is one mistake in the PowerPoint, and I will correct because okay. it looks that I delete one slide. <laughs> okay. Case, my point know. was uh, was the following. I mean, I've, I've is that you, I'm surprised that you have not mentioned the origin or the etymological uh, origin of basic style. I mean, twice six, and which is a little bit complicated. It has to do with the Roman civilization and so on. Yeah. And we keep usually the meaning of leap year, which is uh, leaping through the, dis the, the, difficu the difficulty, if you want, leaping with jump. In Arabic, it is, uh, it is called the Senel Kebisa. The, and it's mean a little bit different. It is the intercalary, uh, uh, intercalated year. We intercalate, uh, I mean, an, ad, an additional, uh, uh, I mean, day, or we insert a day. In, in English, we are leaping, we are, we are jumping in a sense. But originally, it is more complicated, as you know. It has to do with the Roman, the complication of the Roman calendar. So I think it's, it is worth, it will be worth mentioning the basic style. People are confused why twice six by six to twice six and that's a useful addition you may want to consider in the future thank you 
Thank you, Jamal. Uh, I know that uh, the Arabic culture is a very astronomical, really. <laughs> I know very well. And of course, uh, your contribution will be very special in this session uh, because I, I think that we are using many, in astronomy, many words from Arabic origin. Uh, there are many stars that begin Al, they are Arabic names, and they are, I don't know, another concepts, al mukantarat for instance, is Arabic also. We use many things. Then uh, I think that we have to learn a lot about your contribution. And uh, if you want, we can add this, if you help me, in the PowerPoint. Because I think, in any case, I, I explain about the knowledge that I have. Then, of course, uh, I don't have knowledge in your culture, in China, in Indonesia, and in many of other, of course. Yeah, I'm Thank sorry, you. I was talking about the bisex style, bisex style, I, I think it's pronounced that way. Wait, is it called the, the bisex style year? I mean, that's what I was mentioning. The bisex style is a complicated, for people who do not know the origin, I mean, yeah. B, I, twice, six, which is Roman, and that's what I was make, most, mostly mentioning. That was the point that I wish it, that you will comment or you will add in, the, in your presentation in the future. The etymological yes, thing. Okay, that's the all. problem that have the Romans. They don't have your numbers, the Arabic numbers, and then everything was very difficult to count. This is a serious problem that they have, because when they put the ne the the numbers of one year, it was very complicated. You know, <laughs> how do you? They use letters, and it is not. Uh, and it was more or less the same uh, complicated concept for the calendar. It's exactly the same, I think. Uh, they need the Arabic numbers. That you create the number, Arabic numbers and the zero. And this is a very, very important thing. I am maths. And this is essential, I think. Well, sorry, I think that we talked too much or Rosa talked too much. And we continue, if you agree, with the PowerPoint, uh, with the next presentation. Uh, yes. That it could be, I don't know, if we have in this moment. Uh, the next I have one. it. I have it. I can share. The next okay. one is, uh, wait a minute, just to put it in full screen. Okay. Uh, uh, I don't know if Fatima is here. Hi. 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 Hello, everyone. Ah, hello, Fatima. Hi. hi. Okay. I will stop my, my screen and uh, mm -hmm. open the space to you for them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Hello, Fatima. Hello, hello, everyone. Um, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Fatima Shemilasa, and today in this presentation, I will share you some information about the novels. Nowruz is a Persian New Year, and two days ago, we start New Year in Iran, and uh, holidays start in Iran, and I will give you information about some roots, some origin and background of this special event. And this event, not only in Iran, in many countries uh, are celebrated. Okay, let's start. At first, I will uh, speak about the origin and the historical uh, perspective of this event. After that, I will introduce you some customs, ritual, tradition, and after that, we look at some uh, astronomical background of this event. Uh, what is the nose? Uh, exactly, we don't know when people in the Iran region, the Persian, in the past, it's not to celebrate this special event. Nowruz is the uh, first day of the new year in Iran, and we celebrate this special event in the first day of spring in Iran. And more than 3,000 years, people in this region uh, celebrate this event. And but what's meaning the Nowruz? Nowruz is the combination of two words. No means new and rose means the day. So no rose means new days. And I think it's completely clear because the springs 
coming the springs it's um uh, when the spring comes it's uh, show us everything's will be renewed and everything is start to grow in the nature and uh, as i said you we don't know when people start this special celebration but uh, we know it is uh, rooted in the uh, ancient uh, religion of Iranian, Zoroastrian. And uh, from 3,000 years ago, they start to celebrate this special events. We have some evidence in the uh, Persepolis. Persepolis, uh, as you, I think, Rosa, remember this special place. Uh, first of all, it was a capital of a comedy. Uh, it was a, a one of the large and biggest empire of Iran. And as you can see here, this picture show us, uh, and it is uh, the uh, items that uh, remark us the nose. Here you can see the lion, and here is a bull. Lion is a symbol for the warm season, and the bull is the uh, symbol for uh, cold and winter. And the lion start to eat in the bowl, and it's a, it's it's a, it's a completely uh, cooperate with the uh, rising the Leo constellation and setting the uh, Taurus constellation. And uh, if I want to tell you about some mythological uh, roots of this special event, uh, in the Shahnameh, uh, Shahnameh is the, one of the famous Iranian books, and uh, it's uh, the book uh, full of the story about the people, the heroes, and the kings. In the Shahnameh, Ferdowsi wrote when the king Jamshid gave the harmony and peace to uh, its people and saved them from the darkness and uh, save them from the winter, the nose start and every people that call that they know this means new days. And many people these days celebrate this special ceremony. More than 300 million people in Iran, Afghanistan, Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan, in the central uh, Asia, in the west uh, of Asia, or in China, or Romania, I know, or Albania, they celebrate a special, this special event. And we have some ceremony and some tradition before the Nuruz, in the Nuruz and after the Nuruz. Before starting the Nuruz, we start the Khanatekani, meaning the shaking the house. Uh, our mom uh, forced us to clean everything. The house must be clean, as you can see. And other things is a celebration and uh, is Charsham Besuri. During the Charsham Besuri, we set a fire and uh, we dancing around the fire and singing, dancing or jumping. And we say to fire, uh, uh, in Persian, I will say, and after that, I will translate, that the man as to surhieto as man, which means uh, fire, uh, I will give you my pain, my illness to you, and you give. I will give your redness and power and energy. And uh, when uh, two Khanatekani uh, and Charsham Besuri happened before the Nowruz, and exactly in the Nowruz, uh, we prepare a, a special table. We call this Hapsi, as you can see in this picture. And uh, we make a table, uh, which is um, collecting a seven uh, items, each of them start by S, uh, and all of them represent and the symbol for the nature, happiness, and for the health. For example, sabze, sabze is a wheat or a lentil sprouts, and it's a symbolized for a growth, or samanu is a sweet pudding, it's a symbol for a uh, sweetness and fertility, or sandred is a dried oyster, is a symbol for love. Sear is a garlic, a symbol for health, and seed again for be beauty and health. Soma is a symbol for light and uh, success, and circa is a vinegar, is a symbol for a patient and age. Uh, during the uh, Norus and exactly in the Batman, time of Norus, John. Could you use the full screen in yes, your PowerPoint? Yes. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I forgot. <laughs> I'm Thank sorry. You.
Okay, I'm sorry, I forgot. And uh, during the uh, this special event, every people maybe gather with their family or go to some uh, public place and start their New Year's together and family start to gathering and they give the gift for children. And the final of this a special event is a Sizde Beda. We have two weeks holiday, especially for a school and children. And uh, the Sizde Beda people go to picnic in the garden, in the nature, and they uh, say goodbye to the Nowruz. But uh, Nowruz, what is the Nowruz and the astronomical background of this special event? Iranian uh, people have many festivals, and four mm -hmm. of them was very important for them. And uh, all of them was coincidence with astronomical events. For example, our nose is a start exactly in vernal equinox, or Tirgan a start with summer solstice, Mehrigan a start with autumnal equinox, and Yangan night is a start winter with the winter solstice. Between uh, these four, Nowruz is the most important. And after that, Yalda night, and we celebrate this uh, event uh, these days. And as you can see, it's a special uh, table for the Yalda. It is a, uh, evidence for the uh, Mehregan. And uh, exactly when we organize the Hafsin table, all people of uh, family gather around the table, and we are uh, waiting for the exact time of vernal equinox. For example, this year, the vernal equinox was in the sixth morning, uh, 6, 36 minutes and 26 seconds. Exactly, we look at our watch, okay? And we are waiting, okay, no, one minute, one second. Okay, happy new year after the sun exactly arrived to vernal equinox. Our new year starts and we say Eid Mubarak, Nowruz Mubarak. And it's a need a very precise calculation. Many Asian astronomers, Iranian astronomers, uh, try to modify this time because it was very important. And as you know, it's when the time sun crosses the celestial equator. And in this time, the, time, uh, the length of day and night would be equal. So it was very important for Iranian, and our calendar in Iran is completely based on uh, observation. And we use solar calendar. So observation was very important for us. More than 2,000 years, uh, we use the solar calendar. And uh, every time uh, our astronomer try to modify this calendar in the Near ten, uh, near thousand years ago, the news wasn't exactly in the start of the spring. So some astronomers tried to put the news and uh, in the exact time of vernal equinox. So uh, a group of astronomers, one of their member was Omar Kayon, uh, start to do a did the best observation. And after that, we have the Nowruz exactly in the time of vernal equinox. And what is, is very important about uh, Iranian calendar is that uh, is that uh, we have uh, two things. Uh, our astronomer do two things about our calendar. One of them is uh, about our months. The other is about the leap year. Uh, about our months, uh, at first I will show you. Uh, our astronomer, our Asian astronomer, they decided to uh, six months, the six first months of the year, each of them have a, uh, has a uh, 31 days. And the next five months have a 30 days. And the final months, we call the final months span, sometimes have a 30 days or sometimes 29 days. It's completely based on that uh, this year is, uh, that year would be a leap year or not. If the year is leap year, so the span would be 13 days. If it's not a, ter it's, uh, it's not a, a leap year, it would be, it has a 29 days. And it's completely uh, based on the speed of 
uh, Earth in its orbit around the sun. So they do this to uh, put exactly the vernal equinox and novus and other uh, celestial and uh, equinox in the exact time of day. Uh, another thing is uh, important about Iranian calendar and their works is that uh, in 200, uh, in 2020, uh, we have a great cycle. Uh, as you can see, 2137 uh, of them is a normal year. We have uh, all of them has a 365 days and we have 683 leap years. But what is is interesting about Iranian calendars is that sometimes our uh, leap years is uh, four years, each four years, and sometimes uh, each five years. And uh, we have a, a small six, and this small six uh, sometimes is 29 years, and sometimes is 33 years. And all of them start by the first, uh, our first leap would be five years, and other uh, leap year would be each four years. And all of them uh, is based on Hayom and some astronomers, some are same as Khazani or Tusi, their activities. And one of the other famous our uh, astronomer, Iranian astronomer, who did the best observation is a Sufi. Uh, Abdul Rahman is Sufi. He is uh, one of the astronomical, uh, uh, who is uh, the Iranian astronomer and he lived in Isfahan, and he did his observation in Isfahan, and uh, he has a very famous book. Uh, in Persian, we call this Solar al -Kavake. in English, the book of image of fixed stars. Uh, he completed his uh, book in uh, 600 and, uh, 964. What is this very important in his observation, he mentioned uh, some things uh, on uh, some things uh, such as galaxy or caluster in his book. Uh, for example, in his book, for the first time, he mentioned the Andromeda, Andromeda galaxy as a cloud, uh, a small cloud. And it is the first time we can see that uh, some person mentioned the Andromeda galaxy, the Messier 31, in his book. And it is very interesting. And more than this, uh, in Iran these days, uh, we have many astronomy groups, uh, amateur astronomy groups that uh, they have a very fascinating uh, activity. Two weeks ago, we have a Messier Marathon in Iran, and you can see some picture of this interesting competition, more than 150 people gather together to try to find the uh, Messier object, most of them students, and it is very interesting, as you can see their picture. And another thing, uh, I put uh, this picture. Uh, she is, uh, I you know, got this picture from Jasmine Mokmeli. She is an American Iranian astronaut, and I prepare for you a half scene from Messier object. She put uh, her half scene in ISS, and I put my Messier half seen around this uh, special table in the uh, half seen table in the ISS. And it is our, um, the one thing, uh, two things is very specific uh, about our, uh, about our nose. This picture is our uh, Sakhab astronomy community and it is our gathering after Nourouz. Uh, each year in the second of Nourouz, we gather and we speak about astronomy and uh, we review everything that we did in the last year. Two things about Nourouz is very specific. One thing is that it is unrelated to any religion, any race or belief. As you can see, Many Muslim, Christian, or Zarathustrian people um, celebrate this special event. Another thing is that it is completely based on astronomical events. We are waiting for vernal equinox to start our new year. So the start of our new year in the different parts of the, uh, the world uh, happen in the exact time. For example, 
uh, Investor New Year. Uh, you are waiting for the uh, January 1st. And the January 1st is different from one country to another country. But the very one equipment happen in the exact time in the world. And uh, it is my final uh, slide. It is a poem from Hanyang. I will uh, uh, for I will say in Persian and you can read in English. Uh, and thank you for your attention. بر چهره گل نسیم نوروز خوش است در صحن شمن روی دلفروز خوش است thank you very much for your attention great very nice presentation very nice presentation for them well if uh, there is uh, any question uh, hakim do you have the hand rise or not very nice presentation thank you very much yes <laughs> Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Fatemi, I've been actually in Tehran in 2009 for the Astronomy Olympiad, and I, I think I miss uh, a very uh, nice information about Nowruz in, in Iran. So uh, uh, so do you, do you find that young people until now, they, they, they have uh, 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 this literacy of Nowruz uh, uh, well in, 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 in Iran? Yes, completely, completely. Um, as you know, uh, uh, in Iran is the most uh, holiday, is the, and it is the important festival for us. Okay, so uh, three days before the Nowruz, we start our celebration, as I told you, uh, by Char Charshambe Suri, and we continue, and it is especially interesting for children. Okay, for example, yeah. as you can see in my previous uh, picture. Uh, from our astronomy club, many children join us to celebrate this, or they uh, go to different places. And uh, many people speak about this special event because many people know. Uh, they ask us and they ask themselves why we are waiting for Norus in this time, and mm -hmm. uh, the time of Norus change next time. For example. Uh, the next Noruz will, will, will be at 12, okay? Yes. So yeah. they ask and they ask their friends, they ask their parents. Mm -hmm. I see. Well, very interesting. And you, you have this, uh, say, uh, clearing house for all the students to answer the questions about this, right? Yes, yes. Uh, we are cleaning our classroom too mm -hmm. <laughs> in mm -hmm. our schools. Excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Fatima. You're welcome. It was a very nice presentation. I, I remember when I visited uh, Iran that at night there are many people in the street with many places that they sell uh, different uh, different of this special seven objects. <laughs> and it was uh, really a very, very nice, very common and all the people involved. Yes. And it was very, very special. Thank you. You're welcome. I hope to uh, see all of you in next Nowruz in Iran. We are ready in our <laughs> special uh, astronomy community, in Sangab astronomy community. Now yeah, I am in our community. As you can see, I have some uh, telescopes or shuttle or uh, everything I have in this special uh, community. We have in a special community. We are ready. If you want to come to Iran, it would be our pleasure. Next, no rules. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> what is really great is to maintain the tradition also, to maintain the history and the, and remember the, the old people who uh, create this uh, complete feel of uh, ideas uh, connected with the, connecting the, the human being with the sky. That is great. Rosa, estás muteada. You are mute. Yes, I know, I know. <laughs> well, uh, do you do you want that I pass the next one? Uh, I believe yeah. so. Do you have the the presentation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. I will do it. Okay. And well, the next speaker. Oh, sorry.
Uh, okay, the next speaker that we have now is uh, Frederick. One moment, I would like to put the one now. Okay, it's Frederick Pito. Uh, he is an astronomer in the Pic de Midi, France, in Toulouse. <laughs> and uh, this uh, is the special person that will talk about the Messier catalog because uh, you know that the first idea was to to invite to all the people to work in this catalog after we decide to involve other uh, objects in the South Hemisphere. But I think uh, the first idea was uh, the Messier. And then we would like that to have one specialist that explain uh, some details about this uh, catalog. Uh, Frederick, are you ready? Yes, I am. Thank you. I need you to share your screen so I can share mine. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes. All right, can you see it? Yes, very well. Very good. So greetings, everyone. Um, as uh, Rosa Maria told you, I'm Frédéric, and I work in Toulouse in the southwest of France. I'm part of being an astronomer. I'm also an ACK for the OAE, so the Office of Astronomy and Education. And I'm the president of uh, non-profit organization, a bit like NASA, but with less ambition, say. It's called Clearice, also the same is to foster astronomy education. Excuse me, French Frederick, for the moment. Yeah. Excuse me. I cannot hear you very well. I don't know if it's just for me or for everybody. Oh. Perhaps you well, I have the same problem. Uh, oh, really? The, the oh. voice yeah. is puck, 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 puck. Uh, I don't know. It's, now it's, it's good. It's still okay. Now, now it's good. 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 Now I so I don't move anything. Just my don't my, change my, anything. My mouth. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Um, so uh, it's going to be a very short uh, presentation. I, I I think I hope. Um, the goal is to give you an insight on this astronomer, French astronomer Charles Messier, who built up this catalog that you all know, and. Um, yeah, I would like to show you how we did it and why we did it. And uh, yeah, so first, who was Charles Messier? He was born in 1730 in east of France. And um, he moved to Paris at the age of 20 to become an astronomer. He was not really an astronomer in the beginning. He, he studied to being some kind of uh, uh, account manager, and I didn't know I didn't know why he, he he moved to astronomy. Probably because he liked it, but I didn't find any document uh, mentioning actually why he, he moved to science instead of uh, uh, accounting. Anyway, he became an assistant of a very famous astronomer, a French astronomer called Delisle. And uh, um, from 1758, he actually worked in a small observatory in Paris. It was called Cluny Observatory. It's not the Paris Observatory that we still know. It was a very small one, uh, actually uh, put up by Delisle himself. Um, he was appointed Royal Navy Astronomer. That was very strange and, and surprising to me because I didn't know this detail. And uh, he moved with his wife right after his marriage in this Clenny Observatory in 1771. Um, this Clenny Observatory was actually like a big mansion in, in, in the center of Paris. And um, many people used to live there. But only uh, Delisle decided to turn a part of the building into an observatory. Um, I will come back to this a bit later. And actually, um, Messier lived there until uh, his death uh, in 1817. What mattered uh, for Charles Messier was comets. Actually, he didn't really care about all the other objects present in Saturn, and that's very strange. Um, his um, 
apparently he studied more than 40 of those comets and discovered about 20 depending on the sources you sometimes you find 12 13 about say about 20 discovered uh, comets he was actually dubbed or given a nickname as a comet ferret by the french king louis the 15th at the time and for those of you who don't know what a ferret looks like it's uh, it looks like this it's like a small cat um, but it has, at least in France, I don't know if it's, if it's the case everywhere, but it has the, we, we give this, uh, this small animal the, some quality, like if some, an animal being very curious, um, uh, very clever, and also is a stealer, is a, a, a theft. He, he will take every object he likes or he finds interesting and he will hide it hide it somewhere and collect them um in fact ferret comes from the latin which means uh theft or steal anyway back to charles messier he was accepted uh, as a member of the royal academy of science in paris in 1778 and um yeah so this clan of the is very strange it's nowadays the, the building still exists it was turned into a museum of uh, middle age but the part which we are interested in is this, um, the, the top of the tower here, which no longer exists. It was demolished apparently in the late uh, 19th century. And this part was uh, built by the Lille and it's actually, it's not a dome or a cupola as you may see. It's actually, uh, it used to be a wooden and glass uh, roof. And at the time in France, we people couldn't build uh, big pieces of uh, glass. So you see those very small windows, they could be opened and um, and Messier and all the others would observe through those windows, oops, sorry, through those windows, I mean, those windows could be opened. So in terms of instruments, um, Messier has had at his disposal very small, modest, and low-quality instruments, uh, even for the time. Um, so you see he had a very small uh, refractor telescope, 15 millimeters um, aperture, and he has a, um, also a reflector telescope, like one, 115 millimeters. And this uh, later instrument, the reflector, uh, Messier did not use it so much because it was a very poor quality. Um, its mirror was made of copper and tin, as it's written, and it uh, reflected only the fifth of the incoming uh, light. So it was a very, very poor instrument. And that's one of the reasons why we can observe those Messier objects relatively easily, because at the time, Charles Messier did not have very good instruments to find those objects. So the very first object that he cataloged uh, was the Crab Nebula, uh, called Messier 1 or M1, because uh, in uh, 1758, uh, Messier was looking for the return of what we call nowadays the Halley Comet. So he was looking for the return of the comet predicted by Halley, and he looked for it uh, near the horns of the Taurus Tauri, uh, constellation. And uh, he found one object, which turned out to be M1. And this object did not seem to be moving relative to the other star. So it couldn't be a comet. So Messier had this idea of cataloging all the objects that could be taken for comets. Because once again, um, comets was the only thing uh, Messier was interested in, in. And he thought that, well, uh, such a catalog of like blurry objects could be helpful for the whole astronomical community. So he started his catalogue with M1, the Crab Nebula, but it did not discover the Crab Nebula. It was actually discovered much earlier in 1731 by an English physician and astronomer called John Bevis. And in fact, in the catalogue that we know as the Messier catalogue nowadays, there are many objects that were, that were not discovered by Messier himself. So the very first Messier catalog was published in 1774 uh, in the Proceedings of the Royal Academy of Science. 
and it contained uh, only 45 objects. So the first, the first 44, 45 uh, objects of uh, the catalog that we know uh, nowadays. So in this catalog, uh, Messier would uh, write down the, the location uh, of, the, of the objects, uh, not very accurately, uh, not always at least. And somewhere are, somewhere are drawn, like uh, the one we see here. This uh, drawing is uh, or is supposed to be uh, the, um, the Orion Nebula. So that's about what he saw in this uh, telescope. I mean, that's about what we see today with a binocular or with a very small telescope. Then uh, there were several uh, versions of uh, this catalog. And um, after a supplement of 23 extra objects published in 1780, um, he published his very last catalog in 1781. And this catalog contained only 103 objects. And but you know, well, you may know that the catalog that we use nowadays has more objects than 130. It has actually 110. And those seven so called additional Messier objects. Um, that were discovered by Messier and or his uh, friend and colleague, astronomer Pierre Michin, were added after uh, his death or their death. And uh, it's nice to note that Michin is credited for the discovery um, of at least 29 of uh, what are considered uh, as Messier objects uh, today. So again, the official Messi object now contains 110 objects. So those objects are very different. Um, and again, because the instrument Messier and Messier used could not resolve what they were seeing. So you see very different um, categories of objects. You have one supernova remnant, the M1, that I already talked about. You have star clusters, either open or globular clusters. You have like a H2 nebula, like the Orion nebula. You have galaxies, you have planetary nebula, and you have one or a couple of very strange objects that you wonder what they are doing there, like an optical double star uh, in the... I think this one is in the, the Big Dipper constellation. So you see very different objects, very nice and assumably very easy to observe or relatively easy to observe with, with small instruments, which is very good for us. And uh, indeed, the good news is that the messy objects are visible with uh, small instruments like binoculars or small telescopes. A couple are even visible with the naked eye. I mean, you know the Pleiades uh, on top right, and the Andromeda galaxy that might be seen with a very dark sky. Uh, on, with, I mean, you see the picture on the bottom right. And back to the Messier challenge. Well, between mid March and mid April, if not all, but most of them, uh, of those objects can be observed in a single night, at least depending on the latitude, of course. I saw that the ideal latitude to observe all those objects in one given night in this time period was latitude plus 25 degrees or 25 degrees north, um, which is strange because obviously uh, Messier was not living at uh, plus 25 degrees latitude, but uh, 45 or 46, something like that. But um, to see those in, in the one single night, apparently the ideal latitude would be 25 degrees north. And I think it's about it. Hopefully you didn't hear any crack or any clangs during my talk. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. A nice presentation. Very nice. And a very um, interesting to know the origin of the of the catalogue, because uh, the most part of the people is not very well informed about that. Um, it's good to, to remember these people who who was the 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 origin of uh, the the I I believe the 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 actual 
astronomy with catalogs. The, the thing is, we can use catalogs to have a list of objects to continuously observe in and to record data, which is part of the modern astronomy also. So it's nice to see exactly. this object with another identification. When you work with the, with the students and teachers, the most part of the people believe that uh, the object has only one name. And uh, it's uh, a bit amazing to transmit the information that uh, there are a lot of uh, astronomical objects with 10 names, of, for okay. example, because the different catalogs. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you. It was a pleasure to participate in this session with your presentation. Only we have a little bit problem with the sound, but in any case, I think it was enough, uh, clear in order to understand you. And in any case, I would like to ask to all the participants that they send to us the PowerPoint because we will put it the website in order that all the people can enjoy uh, with more time and uh, they have the possibility to continue learning for many days. Thank you very much, yep. Fred. We have a question by Duruti. Hello, Duruti, okay. how are you? How is I, it's everything fine. in Mexico? <laughs> I'm fine in spite of our political issues. <laughs> I... yes, don't no, don't speak about that, please. <laughs> no, no, politics problems, no. <laughs> Today, no. I, all, all a small <laughs> question related with astronomical heritage. Is there in the uh, Cluny Museum some thing related with uh, uh, his uh, uh, paper? He, not not paper. He, his role has a astronomical observatory. Uh, to be honest, I never visited this museum, but uh, during my reading, my understanding is that everything that belonged to Messier and all the astronomers before and after him was uh, was sold um, to either private uh, collectors or to the to the uh, observatory in Paris. So some of the instruments might still be in the in the museum part of the observatory in Paris, but as I well as I know and as as I understand, there's nothing left uh, of uh, of their of their presence uh, nowadays in the museum. Oh, well, thank you. That, oh, that is incredible. <laughs> yes, but it's strange. Yeah, that's that should be confirmed. I mean, the the best way of confirming this would be to go there and visit it, but. Um, <laughs> The, yeah, what I read, because th this is one of the questions I asked myself when I prepared this talk and said, well, maybe in this Cluny Observatory there are still something, but apparently it's not, there's not. Okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, Frederick. And I would like to invite the next speaker that all of you know, because <laughs> next speaker is uh, Beatrice. Okay. Garcia, that uh, she uh, explained to us uh, a little bit uh, about the Southern Hemisphere. You know that Messier catalog, it was our inspiration, but uh, in this case, we decided to open to other skies our project. Then, Beatriz, when you want. Yes, give me a moment. Uh, it's a very short presentation. Let me see if I can put it in a full screen. Uh, and if not, I will go out because I know how is this kind of thing. Give me a moment, just a moment. Stop share and now again, wait a minute. Okay, now uh, this uh, very, very short uh, presentation is to um, share with you our ideas when we start uh, this uh, special uh, activity for the uh, celebration of the Day of Light. First of all, um, 
the essential objective uh, of this project is to observe at least one of the nine uh, objects uh, which uh, we are proposing as part of the challenge. Uh, and this is the list. As you can see, there are some observables from any hemisphere. It's uh, the same for the North and the South. And we cho choose for the, probably for the first time in a catalog, in the kind of a Messier catalog, it's, it means a, an extended object, a cluster or a galaxy or nebula in the South. Because as everyone knows here, um, Messier catalog is um, possible to, to access for an observer, uh, but um, not fully. It, it means uh, there are a lot of objects we cannot see from the south, mainly the objects concentrated in the uh, deep, uh, Big Dipper or the Ursa Majoris constellation. Um, as the most part of the Messier objects are not accessible from the south, we choose those with, which can be observed from the south, uh, here in circles, uh, Messier 7, Messier 31, 42, and 45, all objects just mentioning. It means the uh, Andromeda Galaxy, Orion Nebula, the Pleiades, and uh, Ptolemaeus Cluster, open cluster. These um, objects are also visible from the south. So there we thought there were the good things to include in our special particular catalog. So uh, for this year, the bridges be between cultures is a north-south challenge because we are proposing the observation of the night nice sky. As you can, you know, the, the starry night is uh, uh, the UNESCO Patrimony of the Humanity. We need to preserve the dark uh, skies and also we need to involve more people in the observation of the objects. If the object uh, can be seen uh, without any instrument, better, because not all the people have a, a telescope, even not all the people have a binoculars. So we include in the south, non-Messier objects, because, uh, well, we have not Messier objects, but we have very interesting and amazing um, special uh, uh, groups of uh, stars. And this challenge of us, all the programs in uh, NASA, um, uh, proposals along the year since, uh, in, uh, since 2018, I think, since the first invitation for the bridges between cultures, is a collaborative uh, activity all over the planet, observing at least one of the objects, sharing the results, images, designs, and inviting also the people to free the, uh, the imagination and produce perhaps, if they want, some tales, histories, um, uh, text, um, speaking about the objects, the mythology uh, be behind the objects, and um, finally propose an special NASA catalog of a special astronomical extended or diffuse objects. You know everything, but uh, I just uh, want to um, justify, if you permit the, the, the word, uh, why we choose this. Well, well, the Pleiades are a group of stars very well known by everybody, present in the ancient books, even um, Ulysses uh, in the Odyssey is uh, related. His Hesiodus in the, um, the, the Tales of the Days, uh, they, he, he described this fantastic group of uh, um, stars. Um, at um, naked A, probably you can you can see only seven. There are people who can see more than seven. But here in Argentina, we call this uh, group of stars the Seven Sisters. But as you know, if you have uh, binoculars or on a small telescope, you can see probably a hundred of stars. Uh, there are amazing things around these stars. 
in the same uh, part of the sky as part of this group, uh, like uh, the images from Hubble telescope permit to detect. And also, I would like to, I, I wanted to include this kind of popular culture, uh, which um, include in the tattoos, for example, uh, these uh, astronomical objects. As you probably know, the moon, the planets, and the Pleiades are the most chosen uh, designs for tattoos. Uh, Messier 32, the Andromeda is a galaxy. Here in the south, it's very difficult to observe, but we can. Uh, near the, the spring, we can see the galaxy very, very near the horizon. I'm not uh, an, uh, an amateur astronomer, so we have here a group of uh, amateurs from Chile who, uh, which will um, uh, explain better how to observe uh, Andromeda. But uh, we believe that uh, everyone on the planet know the name, at least the name. So Andromeda is a myth is a constellation and it's a galaxy. So we have a full set of uh, topics to, um, uh, to, to, to treat and to present in the classroom. Remember that NASA is the network for astronomy and school education. We need to involve teachers, professors, students, even the students from the, 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 the primary school. So. Um, Andromeda is a very well-known galaxy. It's our sister galaxy. It's an spiral galaxy. And now we have very amazing images from, from it because we have a mosaic of uh, observation with different uh, instruments on, the, on Earth, in the space. It means this is part of our proposal, not just to take a photo, not just to observe the object, but also to explain how the astronomy along the centuries changed our vision of the sky, not just uh, all the universe is visible, beyond the visible there are more information, and for some objects this is available, it's in different catalogs. Of course, the other big and great object visible from all the planet is Orion. Orion is, uh, uh, of course, a constellation, is a nebula, is a place where the stars are forming and where exoplanets are forming. So it's part of our proposal because it's another uh, zone region in the sky uh, with a lot of things to discuss. Uh, for me, Orion is like a bird. Uh, is Messier 42, but the head of the bird is Messier 43. So it's important to uh, mention this. We, we didn't include all the Messier objects in the list, but as part of the observation and the introduction to the, to the people into the, this amazing catalog is to take uh, care and to pay attention uh, that near these uh, regions in the skies, there are more things, more things near Orion, Messier 42, and the head of uh, the bird uh, of the nebula, Messier uh, 43, which uh, it has another name, NGC uh, 1982. There are a lot of open clusters and um, amazing things to access if you have a small telescope. Remember that Orion is visible naked eyes. So if you have not an instrument, you can also access the object. Um, we see seven Ptolemaeus cluster. We choose this object because it's in Scorpius. And Scorpius is a very well, very visible a constellation in the winter in, in the southern hemisphere. Orion cross over our head in the southern hemisphere in winter. It's the constellation of winter. Uh, and because of this, we select this cluster, visible in the north, but also very well known and visible, accessible from the south. And um, Orion is the second probably constellation uh, better known for the people. The best one is Orion. And the second one is Scorpius. So 
here we have this beautiful open cluster, which was observed by all the telescopes, of course, and where we have a field of the stars, incredible, amazing, with different masses, different temperatures, different colors. Well, between the objects we select outside the Messier clusters, the uh, Messier cluster, sorry, uh, the first one was the Iades cluster. We discussed a lot about this because the Iades is an especially particular open cluster because uh, as it's the nearest open cluster uh, to, to us, um, it's difficult sometimes to understand that these spurs, some uh, spread stars are a cluster, a real cluster, but it's an opportunity to explain the different views of the universe if we take into account the distances. So the, the Iades cluster or Iades cluster, as we mentioned in the South, is like a V, hmm? the V. And um, it's very well uh, known, it's visible naked eyes. And um, in the region, the brightest star, the brightest star is uh, Aldebaran. It's not part of the cluster. Many people believe that Aldebaran is part of this cluster, but it's in the middle, in the middle of the, uh, um, the visual. Uh, direction. So uh, it's easy to um, um, recognize, it's in the Taurus the bull uh, constellation and um, is uh, part of our proposal. Uh, Taurus, Orion, uh, the Pleiades, all these objects are part of the same myth. So our invitation to write about this uh, observation is connected with this. We can talk about the myth, we can talk, talk about the objects, and we can um, probably reinterpret it, if you, if you want to, to say like that, reinterpret the skies in the, um, in the modern vision. The other uh, non-Messier object we, we choose is uh, a, a, probably the biggest uh, globular cluster in Centauri, Omega Centauri, a, a beautiful object. Also detectable naked eye with uh, a very dark sky, of course, is in the beautiful constellation of the Centaurus, where is the Southern Cross. So is part of another very well-known part of the sky, visible all the year in, uh, almost all the year with, um, with uh, well, without any, without to choose a special place in the south. And um, uh, was identified as a non-stellar object by Edmond Halley, in 1677, and because of this also, we choose this uh, object. We, there is uh, the opportunity to speak uh, about Edmund Halley, um, and it's the largest non-globular cluster in the Milky Way. So, it's big, it's beautiful, detectable naked eyes, and it's a good opportunity to uh, try to um, put all together the objects in all the region uh, of Centaurus. The other object, non-Messier object, uh, included in our list is NGC 4755, the jewel box. We include this because probably is one of the most beautiful open clusters in uh, the sky. It's not visible naked eye, but, you, but with the binoculars you can detect at least a small triangle near a Beta Crucis star. Uh, this um, cluster was discovered by Nicolas Luis de la Caye. And um, the name of the jewel box was assigned by John Herschel. And in this sense, also, is uh, mm, uh, we like to remember the Herschel family. 
uh, which was uh, our first tooth for the um, for the bridges uh, between cultures. Remember the detection of infrared some years ago, and now we. Uh, contact again the Herscher family um, in this uh, ch Messier challenge with Messier and non-Messier uh, objects. Um, John Herschel described this beautiful um, um, uh, set of uh, stars, these clusters, as a superb piece of fancy jewelry. It's amazing. All the people uh, who can travel to the south uh, wanted or want to to see this amazing cluster. As you can see, there are different colors. The stars have different um, uh, evolutive state, mainly this very red giant star, and um, this small triangle with the uh, with a, a small telescope. Uh, is transforming in this beautiful field, uh, field of uh, full full of sky uh, with um, a better telescope. So it's one of our our choose for this uh, for this challenge. And as the Messier object include also the galaxies, well, the two galaxies for excellence in the southern hemisphere uh, are the uh, Magellanic clouds. Everyone can see the Magellanic clouds. Probably not all the people identify these small clouds as galaxies. It's an opportunity to talk about this. As you know, there is the large uh, Magellanic cloud and the small Magellanic cloud. In particular, the large Magellanic cloud has a, a very nice region called uh, 30 Dorados or then the Tarantula <laughs> um, Nebula is a um, well, star formation region. And um, they can be detected uh, without any instrument. And um, was first reported in the 16th century by Italian authors, but was studied in, um, well, the first um, data we have about the name Magellanic clouds uh, date uh, from 1847. It's very recent, in fact. Um, uh, uh, Jean, uh, was also Jean Herschel in the um, stay in South Africa who um, chose this name for these galaxies and also study uh, all the objects in this uh, amazing irregular galaxies. So let's see the challenge timeline. Well, here are the months, April, May, June, July, August, September. We invite to prepare this challenge, discuss about uh, the objects to see, the, the, the great, the, the, the biggest thing or the, the, the maximum thing is to observe the nine objects, but at least to observe one and discuss with your people, with your groups, in your clubs, in your um, associations, what to do. Mm -hmm. uh, make the research about the history behind the objects, the characteristics, uh, uh, all the images that you have available. Uh, we believe that uh, by June you can start probably um, the formal observations, but you can start tomorrow if you want. Re resist. The important thing is to register the meetings, take images of the celestial objects and the people involved in the activity. In July, of course, you can continue with the observation, with the, dis uh, the design of the, uh, the text, if you propose a text, and of course, uh, capture more and more audiences in the schools, in the um, amateur groups, in the um, communities, and everywhere. Um, in August, the, the idea is to start the discussion about what we want to do. It means define the NASA catalog, which are the best objects to include in the NASA catalog. This catalog to propose as part of our uh, one of our workshops, the, pre the preparation of one observation. More of you are NASA ambassadors, so you know which is the proposal by NASA. But there we have not a catalog. We have not a proposal of the list of objects to observe. 
and it's time to have one. This was part of our decision for this year, to recover the dark sky, to recover the night of the of the astronomy in the night. Remember that NASA proposed activities for the day because the classes are during the day, but now we want to include also the night observation and to create a, our own catalog with Messier, non-Messier, and perhaps another object. Remember here, there are not planets, not stars, mm, the moon is outside, of course. Uh, here are extended objects, diffuse objects, like in the Messier catalog. And finally, in September, you need to send us the results, the images, the designs, and if you prepare some ta details, the conclusions, and the comments and suggestions to make our catalog. What is the best catalog for school is an answer we will answer together, together after this challenge. Some tips and insights um, for the participants. Observe at least one of the objects. Take the photo. The photos are very important. Take the photos with the cell phone. Do not, uh, don't take care about, uh, I have a good camera, not a camera. Uh, I have a telescope, not a telescope. If you have a monocular, a binocular, if you have nothing, just your cell phone, which is a, an instrument that uh, uh, almost all the people uh, have nowadays. Uh, take the photo with the cell phone. If you have problems, we have people to support us uh, for the observations. Make a design, invite the people to also to design what they are seeing. Remember, I said the Orion for me is a bird, for other people it's a butterfly. Well, use uh, this uh, kind of uh, cultural and artistic activities for um, involve more people. Uh, if you wish um, young people in the group, and you know for the young people it's a bit, it's a bit difficult to observe some diffuse uh, and extended object because you need to train a, a bit your eyes. Well, from the images, from the tales, they can liberate the imagination and make a very beautiful designs without any doubt. Write a story, this is optional. And finally, send your work to NASA. You know how to contact us. We have a, a website where all the information to produce uh, the, uh, the challenges along the years, the bridges between cultures is in uh, all the information is in our website and our, our contact by mail is nase.newsletter. So that is all. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Beatrice. I would like to insist that the people send to us their photos, their uh, poems, if they want, their feeling, what they feel, when they discover some um, a special object that uh, it was the first time that they have the opportunity to see. I remember the the Joel the, when I was in Argentina with uh, Beatriz. I was absolutely very very impressed, and I have in my memory one image that I remember always. I remember. Then uh, uh, these feelings, I think, that are very important because people are feelings really. Then all that you want, you send uh, be, be our uh, impressions, uh, the impression of your students, students doing uh, drawings or doing observation. All that you want. Okay, we are very open and we want to uh, enjoy with you. Remember that uh, many of these objects were observed by the uh, ancient people uh, living in our continents in different places. And uh, most of these objects uh, uh, have another name and, it's repre and represent another things, not the seven sisters, <laughs> another thing. Uh, for the for the Mayans or the Inca people or Araucans here in my, my country. So 
This is also part of the challenge to recover this knowledge from the past and to recognize that this, these objects, because of this, I mentioned John Herschel. Uh, before John Herschel, this object had a name, <laughs> but um, given by by the by the ancient people, by the by the local people, and this is also part of the culture. This is uh, part of uh, what we need to recover our ancient history, like uh, we hear today about Iran, for example. So remember this and try to, to involve all the people in this, uh, which is a, a, an activity uh, with a uh, um, which is connected, linked with a lot of different aspects of the culture. Uh, well, it looks that we don't have any other comment. I have not, uh, I, I don't see any hand rise, so let's go. I think that we continue, okay. Uh, well, next speaker is uh, Hamal Mimouni uh, from Argeli. Uh, he's the president of the African Astronomical, Astrophysic, Astronomical Society. And I am sure that uh, he has a very, very interesting uh, presentation uh, titled uh, Some Lower Latitude Messier Objects and Some Nearby Stars. Uh, Hamal? Yes, uh, thank you very much. I'm uh, no more the president of the African Astronomical Society, by the way. I finished my mandate. We have one okay. mandate only. We are not like in some other countries, other associations. So <laughs> we have to keep it tight. So I'm still in the executive committee, but no more the president. I mean, I'm the past president, if you want the to ask past president. The okay. name president. But anyway, if, may I share my screen? Um, mm -hmm. OK. So here we are. Do you see the presentation now? Uh, do you see? Yes, the, uh, but it's, uh, Jamal, yes, but it's not in full screen. It's coming. Okay. What about now? Mm, I cannot see anything. Ah, now yes. It's but uh, uh, it's in the mode that you have the no uh, the next slide. Eh? Take care. I don't know how to take it off. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm not... Okay. Okay. Yeah, I it's, I see it on my screen that I was not, I didn't see it earlier. I don't know why, but anyway. So let's uh, okay. focus on the. On, on on the right, on the left side. So I, it's actually it's a very modest and pretentious talk. I mean because I as as <laughs> as Rosa known she has I accepted the quite late the, uh, the, the the giving the talk. In fact, it was Hisham Gergori, is my colleague of mine, who has pre prepared it mostly mostly and he could not make it. So I I give it in, on on his name. I'll be pretty short actually. I want to speak about some objects and some nearby stars of those messy objects that we can see in lower latitude. In fact, I will be concentrating in three of the emblematic uh, uh, objects uh, that we are going to see, uh, uh, which are the Orion Nebula, the uh, the Scorpion, and the what else? The third one is the uh, well. We'll see. <laughs> so anyway, so that's the and I'll be connecting it with the with the names uh, at least for the for the for the stars the bright stars that are uh, near this uh, messy object the names in arabic and their origin and that's a kind of a bridging between culture one way of bridging between culture so uh, quickly say the, you know that stars i mean are important in arabic culture and in fact the names of most of the bright stars are in arabic it started all with all the civilizations by the way the chinese the babylonians the Romans and Incas and so on have laid the foundation of early astronomy uh, and they have significantly uh, enhanced our astronomical knowledge. Uh, modern astronomical catalogues still for the, uh, for the bright stars are using the Arabic names Rigel, Rigel, Rigel al Jauza, uh, Betelgeuse, Ibtel Jauza, Saif, Saif, <laughs> and Adebaran. 
uh, which are all Arabic names. Uh, these names, in fact, reflect the rich narratives and the contributions of uh, Arabic scholarship to our understanding of astronomy. So, in fact, one of the renowned and most significant, uh, I mean, figure of early astronomy, Arabic, Islamic Arabic astronomy, uh, Islamic will be uh, more general than Arabic because most of the other civilizations which have uh, which are not even non-speaking Arabic, have contributed to it, and in particular, Abdurrahman the Sufi, who was writing in Arabic, but he's a Persian, and he's, uh, he's, uh, has done uh, an incredible work in uh, astronomy, and especially in surveys, because he has his well-known book of fixed stars, Kitab Suwar al uh, uh where he has uh, meticulously documented the the, the 48 known at that time, 48 known constellations, and which is has made it in a quite a precise uh, 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 way, even by today's standard. And in fact, I'll come back to that, or maybe I can I can mention it right now. He's also the first one to have noted the the spot which now we call the the uh, the 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 the, uh, the 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 galaxy the the Andromeda galaxy, and it's why there are some efforts some years ago by uh, uh, astronomers in 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 the Middle East to rename, to try to rename uh, the, the Andromeda galaxy to be the Sufi galaxy, because he merited it uh, in his catalog. He has, I mean, extensively and or, or very notably shown that there is this spot of this, uh, uh, which is at the place of what we call the, the galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy. And it's unfortunate that people are not, are too much ethnocentric and they have not tried to take into account what was, I mean, the, the historical records for those, uh, for those names. Anyway, so Abdelrahman Sufi, as I say, is an emblematic uh, astronomer and he has done incredible work in putting together the, I mean, this catalog, his catalog of uh, very precise catalog. Now the three objects I will be talking about are laying in the uh, easy. They are easily seen in the equatorial uh, 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 map. I think it's a map which should be also be more popularized in our, among our schools and everybody else. We 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 are too used to the map uh, to the kind of uh, circular map uh, uh, of we see the, the horizontal map. But the equatorial map has many pedagogical use and and interest. Uh, it also it's, it's interesting that you see uh, those two uh, structure those two lines curvy lines which course, uh, and they are intersecting. This is the equatorial plane and the galactic plane. So you can see that uh, it's and see the how the things are dis distributed in this map is quite interesting. And of course the objects that we have been talking I'll be talking about since they are messy objects and I'm saying they are uh, in lower latitude they will be close. From the um, from the equatorial plane. Now, when the equatorial plane uh, um, uh, encounter or or, 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 or or intersect the galactic plane, then the objects are within a very uh, rich uh, background of other objects. Since it's a galaxy, we have many, and uh, it's very rich. And so that's the case for the what you can see here in the map, for example, for the Orion and uh, Gemini and uh, and other. Uh, uh, constellation which are not necessary from the of course from the from the constellation of the zodiac but for the zodiac they you, you know they, so do, do, so there's this interesting interplay between the two planes and when the constellations uh, or objects are within the intersections then you can see a very rich uh, background anyway so let's me start with the orion galaxy uh, constellation sorry the ne origins name first of all so it is uh, the Orion, it is bon, the, the hunter uh, for in, uh, in, in Latin, for the, uh, the Latin or the word, world, uh, but it is, uh, uh, it is known as the Jabbar, the person, the very strong person, Jabbar is a person who is uh, very strong in Arabic, al Jauza also, uh, and it has the famous, uh, most beautiful stars uh, of very uh, colorful stars, First of all is the Betelgeuse, Betelgeuse, Ibt al Jauza, uh, Ibt, al Jauza, c'est Orion, Bet, uh, Ibt, c'est the armpit, les selles en français, or axilla in Spanish and Portuguese. So it is indeed uh, standing at the 
at the armpit of Orion, of the hunter, uh, Rigel, Rigel, Rigel Jebel Jauza, c'est the foot of Orion, and indeed it is at, the, at, his, at, at his foot, as you see, it's a giant, it's a, it's a giant star, by the way. And then Saif, Saif El Jauza, which is uh, uh, at the, uh, where the, um, you see at the belt, where the, 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 the constellation of Orion is standing, then it is the Saif, the, 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 the sword. So you see there's many uh, useful and very uh, meaningful uh, meaning for those uh, stars that it's interesting to know. Uh, uh, the, the Orion's armpit, the foot of Orion, the, the, the safe, the, the sword of Orion. Uh, El Mintaqa, El Nitaq, and Nizam are the three other names of the, the three names of the stars in the of the belt of Orion. Anyway, so that's the uh, one of the first constellations I wish to present, which is uh, which has now what kind of messy object as there in this uh, constellation. There is several of them, beautiful ones. The most famous one is obviously the Orion Nebula, but also the Dumarian's Nebula, also a very colorful one, and M78. So I wish it also that people make connections uh, when they are observing with some astronomical facts or astrophysical ones. You see, I like to say that the Orion Nebula is, uh, is a fake objects, it's a fake thing in several aspects. Uh, let me just bear with me. The first thing is that it's not as colorful or as visual as you can see it in this extended uh, visual uh, uh, photograph photographic uh, uh, picture. I mean, you never see that in the naked eye, nor even with the galaxy, no, no, with a telescope, even if you use the, um, the uh, I mean, the, the, the the best, I mean, the, 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 you need a very long exposure object, uh, a, a telescope, you know, I'm sorry, to, to see them, first of all. And secondly, what you see is not what is there. I mean, that's from astrophysics. I mean, those are objects where stars are born, uh, those kind of nebulae, but they are, the, 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 the light is not coming from where you think. They are thinking, they, they, it's just a rever reverberation of light of objects which are, which are deep inside the, the, the nebula that you often don't see uh, uh, I mean, easily. So it's a fake, in a sense, it's a fake object, like many objects, like the comet, uh, when you see the, the tail and the halo, that's not where the comet is and so on and so forth. So it's interesting if people want to go into this kind of consideration to show that what you see is not what is there or is not, it doesn't match what is the reality of the things. I mean, the, the you know, the, the the star the source of star the, the of light is not the, the 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 light that you see anyway so there's much to elaborate on that I'm not going to go further on that so that's the first uh, constellation the second one is the Taurus constellation Kaukebete Saur the so the star's origins the name of the or of the star is uh, uh, is uh, is well it's all common in the various languages or uh, at least in the in Europe and the Middle East and uh, uh, I, I imagine at least that it's a Taurus, donc it is coming from this the imagination that what we see is the, uh, although it's quite difficult for, for young people to imagine that because they see just a, a triangle, <laughs> but you have to add the picture or the, 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 the diagram and then they say, oh yes, there's a Taurus. That's not so obvious anyway. So uh, the names of the, the most uh, luminous, the brightest star is Aldebaran, Adebaran is coming from Dubur in Arabic, which means back. Why back? Because indeed the 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 the, the Taurus is showing his back, is, is is giving its back to the Pleiades, a Thoraya, uh, which is the 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 the, 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 the this uh, concentration of stars, which is an open clusters uh, in the back. So he's giving its back. So it's called Adebaran, the the bright stars. At the Baran, you see, it's quite interesting, and it's not much. Also, it's, it shows the fancy with the names. I mean, if you see it uh, as it is, you hardly think that it is a. a, a I mean, um, uh, I mean, a Taurus. Anyway, so you see that it's. Uh, it really, you need a lot of imagination to see in this triangle, and even with these uh, Pleiades next to it, any sign of a Taurus. You have to think in terms of mythology that there is. There is the, the Jabbar, this Orion, which is fighting uh, with, he want to hit this Taurus, who is attacking him. So it's a lot of imaginations uh, to understand that. Uh, El Kelbain also, El Kelbain, which is the star that you see. Um, uh, where is it? Uh, do we see it in written here? 
El Kelvain uh, is also um, uh, the two dogs. Uh, it's actually, it is, it is also a misnomer because uh, in Arabic literature, as I saw it quickly, uh, it means the two dogs, actually the Canis minor and, uh, and, 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 and Canis major, which is far, far aside, far away from this uh, object, but they have been through the translation and the misunderstanding and so on, El Kelbain, which, which lie within, you see, lie within next to the horn, one of the horn, it has nothing to do with the two dogs, the Canis minor and Canis major. Also, I should not forget a neh and not and not this is a well, uh, 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 I mean, uh, I mean, uh, this uh, 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 um, star which is uh, at the at the um, at the top of one of the horns, which means blows of the horn. Not not a ha is uh, is uh, is giving blows with the horn. You see, so it's it has a meaning, and indeed the top of the horn could be used <laughs> for that purpose to uh, push away people. Anyway, so that's the. The second constellation. Uh, what what are the play? What are the objects uh, uh, in it? The Messier object. Then the most famous one. I'm just going to keep this one. Is the Pleiades. Uh, the Pleiades are the seven. Uh, so that's uh, correspond to the Greeks. The seven daughters of Atlas and Ple and Pleion, which are uh, shows. It has a correlation to the many uh, to the many uh, stars that there is in this uh, constellation. Uh, to this uh, open cluster. Uh, why they are uh, why they are blue? It's a story which has to do with astrophysics and uh, the fact that they are young stars. Uh, also, the in Arabic culture, at least the number of stars that you see in the Pleiades is used as a test for visual acuity. Uh, if you see three or four or five or six or or even seven, as some do, then you have a very high you have a very good visual acuity, and so it is used as a test. You see. Uh, anyway, so that's uh, an interesting aspect of the Pleiades is the test that uh, that um, uh, is taken by the people to see the visual acuity of the of the persons. Uh, and lastly, the Scorpius constellation, Kaukebat Lakrab, which is uh, also challenging for the reason I'm going to to say. As I say, it means don't Lakrab, the Scorpion in Arabic, and it has a, a bright star at the at the end of the of the tail, which is called shola, a shola, which means in Arabic shela, in shela, the verb shela means raised. It's raised because it's uh, uh, the scorpion is raising its tail. So sorry, there's a mistake in raising here. And uh, uh, and uh, also one of the other next to it, not other star is uh, a lesa, lesa, lesat. I don't know how you pronounce it in in English, which means the scorpion sting. You see, so it's quite an interesting uh, that the, the names correspond to the features uh, in Arabic. Uh, it's not obvious when you read them in, uh, in, 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 in Latin. You see that's what lesat, what mean lesat, what mean shola, and so on and so forth. So that's another beautiful constellation. What is there as Messier object in it? Then these two at least famous um, globular clusters, uh, a huge number of stars, uh, M4 and M80. Uh, among many other, several other objects anyway. But that's what I wished to show you, and I would like to thank you all and give you this, uh, this small present from the Sahara Desert in Algeria, a picture taken by one of the, our famous Alger astro astrophotographers, Mohamed Isa Moussa from Gardaya, and it is a gift for you uh, from our land, our blessed land, Sahara, where you can see the things in, in, in pure Pure beauty shown when you have, of course, in moonless light of the moonless nights. Sorry. Thank you, and that's all I wish to present to you. And uh, I hope you it was useful. Thank you very much. Wonderful night. Wonderful desert sky. Uh, it is very very impressive. Uh, thank you very much for your contribution. It was very interesting uh, that to learn more about the uh, astronomy in, in Arabic, in, in your country, in your culture. And uh, well, I think that really 
you were very important in the history of astronomy and you continue being important. I remember very well the astrolab in in Arabic uh, culture and uh, in all our culture because all of us we are in the Mediterranean area and all of us we are very interconnected. Thank you very much, Hamal. I don't know if we have any questions. Yes, by the Ruti. The Ruti, do you okay. want to Ruti? First of all, uh, thank you for your enlightening talk, uh, Professor Jamal. Uh, only a brief comment. Uh, just uh, was published in Spanish this uh, book uh, concerning a uh, uh, Taurus uh, thing by okay. Professor Cosar uh, in Spanish. Uh, this uh, is uh, uh, interpretations across cultures. And it uh, will be nice uh, to do the same to the other uh, constellations. Great. Thank you. To bring that to my attention. Well, then I, I would like to mention now, thank you. Uh, thank you, Hamad. Uh, the next uh, speaker that we have, it is not here, is uh, Sakari Eko. He is from Finland, and uh, he have uh, he's an excellent photographer, and he has a lot of experience in the, in this area. Oh, and uh, I would like to mention that we have the PowerPoint uh, that he prepared for the session, but it was not possible for personal reasons. Uh, and um, oh, what is that? This is not. The PowerPoint, sorry. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, it is that. Sorry, sorry. Well, uh, I would like to mention only briefly that uh, he prepared an excellent presentation in order to talk about uh, uh, different uh, details of how to take uh, good photos. And I think it is uh, a good idea that for people interested, that uh, try to find the information in our website that we will put all the times how to use these different uh, devices in order to get uh, good results. Uh, I promise you that the results of Sakari are absolutely impressive. Uh, he worked, uh, of course, with an excellent sky, like Hamal in a different voice, but <laughs> wonderful sky. And I recommend that you especially to revise this, uh, this PowerPoint, okay? But uh, I think that the best is that we continue with the next speaker, uh, they are, uh, sorry, I lost, uh, I lost the PowerPoint. I don't know what is the reason, okay. Then uh, the next speaker are from Chile. Jonathan Moncada and Rafael Taucare. They are from Asociación Astronómica Castor y Pollux de Arica. And uh, we are, I, I think I saw one of them connected a little bit before. Uh, Jonathan, maybe, or Rafael? Hello. Ah, excellent. <laughs> Hola. Hello, how are you? There are other people with a wonderful sky. <laughs> but the people in Europe, they, we are very unhappy with this, but well, thank you. When you want, you can begin with your presentation, okay? Please let me know if you are seeing my screen. No for el no for el momento, pero pronto. Not for a moment. We cannot see anything. Uh, yeah. Okay. Now yes. Okay. <laughs> well, hello everyone. I don't know where are you right now and what time is it. So I can't say good day, good night, good evening because I don't know. Hello, everyone. My name is Rafael. I'm here with Jonathan. We are the co-founders of Castor y Pollux, 
We are uh, an astronomy group from Arica in Chile. And we are, um, it's an honor for us to be here with this presentation. It's the first time we go to an international event like this. So thank you very much for the invitation. Why this isn't working here? So we are, as, as I said before, we are astronomy group from Arica in Chile. We have been teaching astronomy here in the northern part of Chile for 11 years. Arica, for you to know, is located in South America. In the left side, you will see a map where Arica is in a star. Right in the, in the corner of the Pacific Ocean between Chile and Peru. Here in Arica, we are uh, very near to the driest desert on Earth the Atacama Desert, and is the first city from the north of Chile, the very closest one to the northern hemisphere. As we know, there is, a Messier, there is the Messier catalog with 111 objects. And there is an, a special event called Messier Marathon, which consists in observe all the objects in one night. Here we know that we cannot see all of them. There are 110, but in Arica, we only, and theoretically, we can see 103. So uh, it's really an adventure for anyone who likes to see the sky. And actually the ma marathon measure is not as easy as it sounds. Back in 2017, Jonathan, told us about this event. We didn't know anything about the Messier Marathon and we didn't even think about it. We said, yes, we're going, we're doing it. So um, we tried this three times and this is why are we here. We like to share with you our experience. The first time was in March, 2017. We spend almost all day looking for a good place to observe the night sky without any clothes. As you can see in that picture, the, there were a lot of clouds around us following our steps. We really spent a lot of time looking for a place because, you know, there is clouds and no one likes clouds in the night sky. After some hours, we found a really good spot to make the marathon. Um, the climate went well, and we started to take action with our telescopes. We achieved the quantity of 96 objects uh, from the catalog. Consider that we only can see 103. It is a good amount for us. It's around like 93% of our theoretical limit, and we were really happy about it. In the picture of the right, you can see a photograph about from the sky that we have in here in Arica. Um, well, there are a little things that we learned that day that I will share with you in a couple of minutes. This was the first time. The second time was in March again, 2019. This time we knew exactly where to go because we found the spot and how to proceed to achieve a higher goal. We know that 90, 96 subject is a good amount, but we wanted more. And we tried to go for more, but we didn't. We only reached 92 objects that night, and we um, there was a two years lab where we learned about photograph. Um, you can see now that we had a little extra time free time to make some photograph like we were thinking what are we looking but in reality we're laughing all night it was really fun then this year in 2024 we tried again to do the Messier marathon we knew the spot but we tried to do something different this time we invite people from the city to join us to the marathon not all, not all of us knew what was happening. So a lot of them 
uh, were not with uh, a lot of food or close to um, go against the cold. So the, we started like eight or 10 cars, but at the end of the night, there were only three. So um, this time the clouds were with us. We cannot control the climate. So um, we went back home a few hours after the, the sunset with this time only 21 objects. Um, um, there is a uh, little things that we learned about this experience. Every year we learn something new. So we like to share with you just a little list of the things. The first one, the important one, the cold hit hard. We cannot forget that. We think that we are, okay, we are in the desert. There's no problem. It's March, it's summer here. So yeah, yeah, let's go. But um, in reality, no. Nope. <laughs> it was really hard for us to stay awake also and um, keep warm our bodies. For around four o'clock in the morning, it was really hard. The first time we suffered a lot, but the second time we were more prepared. And the third one, we knew exactly what we, we were what we were doing. The second thing we learned is a lot of people fall asleep. I was one of them. <laughs> I'm not proud of that, but uh, it happens. We are all humans and in, it is important to maintain a good sleep schedule to endurance all the night because it is hard. It's not as easy as we think. The th th third thing that we have learned, it requires a good plan of observation. What does this mean? We knew that there were a lot of objects and we knew that we have uh, some hours specifically. So we need a good plan to know where to look and when to look. There were um, time gaps between objects that are about five minutes. So we need, the, I don't know, the people to look for the telescope five minutes, that's all. And we have to share the time to see and say, okay, I see it. And then check in our list, what is it? So it requires a good planning and especially, uh, I don't know if to say a lot of telescopes, but more than one, please, please consider that. Um, uh, last but not least is one of the, of the best experience that we ever have lived. It's amazing because it is another level of uh, amateur astronomy because yeah we all know that we can stay for two hours or maybe three hours outside and enjoy but stay all night and looking almost non-stop it is a very good experience and you actually learn a lot learn about using your own telescope how to improve the uh, speed to orient your telescope in the right position and how to uh, difference between objects. We know about clusters, but it is different uh, glo globular cluster than an open cluster. And in that experience, you can see that with your own eyes. And even with naked eye, you can see the objects and you learn a lot. So we do recommend this activity for anyone who is listening. And I think this is the main event to say that because it really, for us, is one of the best experiences that we ever had in our 11 years here in Chile working with astronomy. I don't know if any one of you have any question. We would like to uh, answer anything that you wanted to know. We are here for you. This is solo for presentation. It is a short one, but um, it's because we only have three experience and you know, you enjoy the night more than taking photographs to re register this. Um, we only live the, the experience. Um, this is more or less our experience with the Messi Marathon. I don't know if we are the only one in Chile or in South America who do this event, but anyone has to do it. So here we are. Thanks all of you for your attention. And again, thank for the invitation to this event. It is a pleasure for us to be here. It is good to have a, a, a testimony 
of the people who who is involved in the in the challenge of uh, the Messier Marathon because uh, well and it's good to hear also that your your um, uh, suggestions are part of the NASA course with with uh, when we suggest what to do if you want to be successful in the night observation like uh, the call is hard uh, please uh, take some food because the people is hungry in the middle of the night and some uh, <laughs> some uh, hot a drink because it's cold, etc. and etc. So thank you very much uh, because it's the first person you are uh, the protagonist of the of the marathon. And also, I would like to to mention to say about uh, your comment about um, the whole night working because the whole night working is the work of the professional astronomers. How hard is to be the whole night working? And um, well, it's good. There are uh, connection points to see that when you, when the amateurs, uh, when the amateurs organize the, uh, the, the activities just for a couple of hours is one thing. The, the whole night, the full night is another, but the full night is the normal life for the professional astronomers <laughs> so from the yes from the, all night is is even uh, at the um, sunrise we still want to take more data more data <laughs> <laughs> and all the technicians are closing the domes and, and we are taking more data in uh, what well, when the light is there so thank you very much for your 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 talk it was very interesting really I would like to mention to the <laughs> teachers that they are connected, that uh, if they want to organize an activity with the students, in some occasions it could be a good idea to contact with a group of amateur astronomers, because they can help very, very well to organize the session, to find uh, the objects, because in some cases it's not so easy if they don't know the sky is the first observation or one of the first observations. Then the connection with amateurs, and there are many, many, many associations of amateurs in all the countries in the world. I think it is a good option. Um, it is a special, a special situation of astronomy. I am mathematics, and there are not amateurs in mathematics, <laughs> not in <laughs> physics, not in many, many. And in astronomy, yes, this is one excellent opportunity to use in the schools in order to promote much more astronomy and by means of astronomy science in general. Thank you very much to both of you. And uh, I repeat again that when we see your skies, we feel, especially from Spain, uh, we would like to have this opportunity. Well, they us. also had Thank some you. cloudy, cloudy nights. So yeah. <laughs> this is part of the astronomy. It's part of the interest. The cloudy nights. Okay. Thank you, uh, Jonathan and Rafael. Thank I don't know if you, if you want to say something. Anything else? Mm, Castor we, and Pollux. <laughs> uh, we are open to for, for you, for all of you, to contact us. If you need any suggestions or any help, you have you just Google Castor and Pollux Arica, and that's it. You will have our, our full help. We will, team. by sure. Yes. Anything you need. Thank, thank you. you thank, the... you well, thank you very much. And I would like to introduce the next speaker is uh, Arek. Sorry, one moment. Arek, uh, sorry, next one. <laughs> Arek Mikaelian uh, from uh, Armenia, Burayan Astrophysical uh, Observatory. And uh, Arek, I saw you. Thank you very much. And it's your turn. And thank, thank you, you for because I know you. that Arek was very busy and he has to organize all his time in order to be here. Thank you, Arek. Yes. Am I allowed to share my screen?
I cannot see my presentation. No, it, no. For a moment, we cannot see you. No, not yet. I myself no, don't please. see in share screen window. Mm, uh, I don't know why. Maybe you have there all is the still open uh, or not. Now, okay. No, if we can see your face, which is good, and. Uh, yes. But I don't see when I try to share. I don't see my presentation in the window. Do you want to go out and in, uh, enter again, or what do you prefer? Yeah. Because the screen share is. Do you want that yes. I? Share At the bottom. The bottom. Actually, yes, you have my presentation too. Yes, I have it. Okay. If you want, I can. Okay. Let me try once more and then no, I don't I don't see the uh, oh okay now I see. Okay, no? the okay. Uh, do you see yes. it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Should be now a full screen. Okay. Yeah. It is a little bit different than others. Uh, most of them the presentation were uh, dedicated to Messier object objects, but this is a astronomical telescope. I think this is also useful. Because I give a general understanding about astronomical telescopes in the world, the distribution, what size of telescope do we have, where they are, and uh, of course the main parameters of the telescopes. And just recently we had a presentation from Chile, one of the sites where very big and important telescopes are located. So yeah. let's go. So uh, the first understanding about uh, the optical an optical device is the eye, uh, and prob most probably uh, some. Excuse me, Eric. Excuse me. We cannot see the next slide, and we cannot see the full screen presentation. You see only the first. So only one. the first and uh, fixed in the first one. Yeah, well, now we can see the second one, but it's not in the full screen. Now I put in the full, full screen, is it there? No, it's not, a full screen is not running, I don't know, because you are doing good, but <laughs> well, doesn't matter, don't worry, don't worry. It doesn't you matter, it doesn't matter. We can okay. see. No, no, no problem. Mm -hmm. Is it okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the eye is actually a very small telescope, or let, let us say that the LME telescope is a bigger eye, uh, because it is a lens of seven millimeters uh, diameter, and uh, more, more or less all people have the same size, independent of their uh, height or weight. So it is considered, it is uh, supposed that most of people have the same. But it is, uh, beside the small lens, it, it is a very um, uh, big supercomputer, immense uh, uh, possibilities to uh, reduce, let's say, and to see the image. The resolution is also not very high, only one arc minute. And the dynamic range is very good, extreme dynamic range compared to many, many devices. But the limiting magnitude introduced by astronomers, it is uh, six, uh, six magnitude only. And as we know, each magnitude is 2.512 2 times uh, brighter or fainter of others. So let's go to other slides. Uh, the first telescope, very small one, was uh, invented and built by Hans Lippershey in uh, Holland, in Netherlands. It was called Spy Glasses, 1608. Simultaneously, almost simultaneously Galileo learned about this and uh, invented his uh, telescopes without seeing the telescope in Holland. So he made uh, 15 and 30 millimeter diameter telescopes in Venice, 1609, and made a lot of discoveries, very important ones, uh, because uh, it was the big difference compared to the eye. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, in the historical development of telescopes, many, many telescopes were built, 
and now I will speak uh, for, for as it is also intended for the teachers. So let's just speak about small telescopes, uh, amateur telescope that they can have, or which are available worldwide, and they can have in the school. And uh, mostly they should know that uh, what, what is the construction of a telescope. Here I mention the most important parts that they should just uh, make compose and make a telescope for any observations. Of course, the simplest telescopes are not uh, installed uh, in a correct way and they are portable, but uh, more or less, if you have any knowledge, you can put uh, the uh, directions so you can observe more or less correctly. Uh, the basic properties of telescopes, uh, optics, it is aperture, which is most important for uh, if it is big, you collect more light. So one uh, thing is to increase the sensitivity. The other thing is to just collect more uh, photons and then combine them, uh, focus in uh, one point or small area and then have a uh, stronger, brighter image uh, from the faint stars because most of astronomical objects are very faint. Besides the sun, the moon, maybe a few other planets and stars, most are very faint and we have a very uh, small amount of light to collect, to, to make good observations, good images. So the light collection power is proportional to D in square. Then the theoretical angular resolution, which is also important, is proportional to 1 divided by D. 1.22 uh, lambda divided by D. It uh, means that if you have larger telescope, then the angle resolution is better. So you can resolve smaller details. The image scale uh, given in uh, arc seconds in millimeter is proportional to 1 divided by F, 206 divided by F, uh, if it is arc, arc seconds per millimeter, and F if it, F is in meters. So the total flux of an object at focal plane, also proportional to d square, surface intensity of an extended source at focal plane proportional to 1 divided by f square, and angular field of view, which is also very important, normally bigger for smaller uh, focuses, for, for high wide fields need special designs. So this is very important that during the whole history, almost the whole history of telescopes and astronomy, uh, astronomers couldn't make a wide angle observations because the fields were small and there were no survey before uh, and, and as is, it is considered many uh, discoveries were just by chance but the optics is also has many disadvantages including uh, aberrations and among the most important aberrations are the chromatic aberration, aberration. most of people know these things uh, many of these things from eye, uh, uh, spherical aberration, coma, astigmatism, then field curvature and distortion. Here I show schematically most of them. Uh, coma is, uh, gives images like this, especially the edges of the images is very bad. So the telescope actually can give wide uh, field, but with very big aberrations. That's why we, we say that the field of view typically is very small for a classical telescope. In addition to all this, of course, the optics should be polished very, very accurately, one uh, eighth lambda. So in optical wavelengths, it's very small uh, size. So it means that we, we should have very, very accurate polishing and the surface should be paraboloidal or whatever it is. It should be very correct. Uh, typically, it is uh, done before it was done by hand, and now there are special technologies, and there are a lot of optical schemes. So most of telescopes now are uh, uh, mirror telescopes, reflectors, but uh, first telescopes were refractors, lens, uh, uh, light enters the telescope, and then uh, is focused and then we see the image by eyepiece. 
but there are many schemes of uh, reflecting telescopes. These are Gregorian, Newtonian, Cassegrain, Nesmid, achromatic telescopes when we have both lens and mirror. And the scheme is shown how the light goes through the telescope and then is reflected one or two times, sometimes three times. And then finally you have, for example, in Nesmith focus, you have one diagonal mirror and after the two reflections, you just turn the light to, to the side of the telescope and make observations, uh, more or less typically uh, similar to Newton one. But in Newton, it is only one reflection. So then uh, we have also, wide-angle telescopes, Schmidt types. The first Schmidt type telescope was invented in 1930, and it was really a big discovery and revolution in astronomy because uh, astronomers started to do surveys. It means that we could observe big portions of the skies uh, and then combine them and explore these fields to to detect, to select some or pre-select some objects for further more detailed observations. So it is very important to have such uh, telescopes as well. And of course, the telescope mounting, the mounts could, could, can be different, equatorial, altazimutal, fork mount, uh, Dobsonian mount. So uh, these are shown for small telescopes. For more, most of big telescopes, the mount is altazimutal. altazimutal. And uh, the mirrors, the nowadays mirrors, which are very big, uh, they cannot be uh, monolithic because it's very heavy and very big. So they do uh, segmentation, segmented mirrors. For example, this is the example of Keck 10 meter telescope. So uh, all telescopes larger than 8 meter, they are segmented. Here I have some scheme built uh, lo in logarithmic scale here. And in logarithmic scale, you see that linearly uh, the telescope size increased uh, in years. So starting from Galileo's telescope, I put here only the largest telescopes uh, of the time. So if uh, it was the record largest telescope of the time, then except of a few uh, here, uh, big, very important telescopes. So it goes in increasing. Uh, then trend so we see that uh, in which year what was the size of the largest telescope and here i have uh, now collected uh, the most updated list of big telescopes uh, largest telescopes in the world uh, 10.4 meter is the gran canaria uh, telescope grand telescope of canarias in canary islands then we have two more or less 10 meter telescope Keck one and Keck two Nine meter telescopes, Hobby Eberle and South African, and then uh, a number of eight meter telescopes, including four VLT, very large telescopes in Chile. So, as you see, most of them, this is the altitude of the site, and uh, as you see, most of the telescopes are in collaboration because ESO itself is a collaboration of 14 uh, countries, and then uh, some others uh, which are in. Uh, Canary Islands or um, Hawaii also are in, uh, in collaboration, made in collaboration of several countries. This means that telescopes are really very, very expensive and small countries are just, uh, uh, let's say, it's impossible for any small country to build a big telescope and mostly they uh, combine their efforts for this. Uh, this is in uh, Canary Islands, very nice site uh, where uh, where the clouds are below uh, the location of the telescope. Mostly they are below. And it's very amazing that you can go uh, higher than the clouds as, as on the plane. And then you make observation, uh, typically always you have uh, good weather. The location of uh, the most of the observatories having more or less uh, big telescopes in the world so we see that still, by numbers, Europe and North America uh, have most of telescopes, uh, which are not very good sites from a astronomical point of view, as to climate. climate. Uh, so uh, still, uh, the efficiency of uh, big telescopes is not so high because we have very few in Hawaii, as you see, the three best sites uh, are Hawaii, then Chile, and Canary Islands here. Okay.
And here I show the geographical location of these three sites. On Hawaii, it is Big Island, Mauna Kea, and Canary Islands, La Palma Island, and north of Chile, several locations. This is a statistical, uh, let's say, uh, uh, I would say a statistical table giving telescopes in different parts of uh, the uh, world. Europe, Asia, Africa, by the way, Canary Islands, I consider Africa because geographically it is Africa. Then Australia, Oce Oceania, uh, and North America and South America. So here we see that a lot of uh, telescopes are in North and South America, North because it is probably uh, together with Hawaii. And the numbers are uh, larger than 9 meters. We have 5 telescopes in the world, larger than 8 meters, 14, etc. And 83 telescopes larger than 2 meters. So these are professional telescopes. But if we go to smaller telescopes, there are so many. And now they are built uh, lots of, uh, even uh, among the robotic telescopes, there are a lot of 1 meter, 1.5 already. So uh, one cannot keep the correct record of such telescopes properly. So you, sh you should have a very often update. But uh, these uh, telescopes larger than two meters, two meter, are more or less, uh, let's say, some definite number and not very many. So we still need more and more telescopes, especially not all are very efficient and the sites are not very good. But in addition to this, astronomers use uh, interferometry. So you can have uh, light from two telescopes, and if you correlate the light with interfer interferometric laboratory, then you have as if you, you observe from one and a side of the telescope and the, the other side, and with this big pace, you have very big, uh, large resolution. This is very important. Without the collecting uh, areas are not larger, only the combination of these two mirrors, or several, if you have several, we can combine four or more. For example, if we uh, look at the biggest telescope interferometers in the world, so we can consider VLT as a interferometer of four telescopes, though let's say it is not used in this mode very often. Uh, then Keck interferometer, two telescopes, uh, two big telescopes, uh, nine meter, 9.8 meter, large binocular telescope, again two meters and this is the combination this is the um let's say uh, the uh, diameter of the mirror which could give the same uh, efficiency which have the same collecting area as a uh, combination of four eight meter or over here two nine meter telescopes so that's why i give this number here and then large binocular telescope, two telescopes, Gemini interferometer, which is very, very distant. One is in North America and one is in uh, South Chile. And then two Magellanic uh, telescopes, 6.5 meter. Some examples, for example, these are for uh, VLT in Chile. And you see this VLT interferometer laboratory, also two Wide-angle telescopes here exist, VST and VISTA. So, itself, only this is very important observatory. Keck telescopes, Hawaii, Mauna Kea. So, here we have uh, two big telescopes which can combine their observations. Uh, so, here I, I give also the uh, baseline, you see. Keck telescopes have 85 meters. Large binocular telescope, which I give here, is 22 meters between these two mirrors. The one side and the other side, the maximum separation is 22 meters. And Gemini, north and south, these are two different telescopes located very far from each other. Among the future telescopes that just give you imagination, give understanding what whatever we should have in the future, 39 meter telescope is the extremely large telescope by ESO, the European Southern Observatory. Then uh, the planned 30 meter telescope, which is now stopped but still a project uh, by Americans with uh, collaboration 
with uh, Canada, Japan, China, and India. Giant Magellan uh, Telescope, uh, which will have uh, compared to uh, the one that we have two uh, 6.5 meter here, we will have seven such telescopes. And then uh, Vera Rubin Telescope is very important because it will be Schmidt type telescope of eight meter and probably it will also give a revolution in astronomy like we had recently years by Sloan Digital Sky Survey, by uh, Gaia, for example, and now uh, James Webb is uh, expected. This is the ELT, the Extremely Large Telescope, uh, then this Magellan Telescope, Giant Magellan Telescope, and uh, Vera Rubin, the 8 meter. And the comparison of the mirrors. You see here uh, basketball, volleyball, or tennis court, and you see the uh, comparative size of the telescopes. So these are future ones, and these are existing ones. Most are existing, and these three are from the future. So it means that uh, really astronomers have a lot of success in advance in uh, building telescopes. I am not speaking here about space telescope, about radio telescopes, about solar telescopes, because it is a very big uh, field of uh, investigation and presentation. Only in 15 minutes it is not possible. So I just focused on optical telescopes. A uh, very important thing that uh, you, you need to um, uh, improve the size of the image because typically atmosphere is very bad for uh, this uh, imagery. But now I need to go to full screen mode. I am not sure if it works for you. So here I show how uh, the computers, uh, how we detect the wave front and then correct by computer and then uh, receive a uh, very good uh, wave front. Do you see now this uh, or not? Uh, then largest historical no, Schmidt. See, Sorry? Uh, we cannot see the full screen, so. Oh, uh, the full screen is not okay. Because it's for, this was an animation. But anyway, the largest historical Schmidt telescopes they were not very many. Most of them are stopped now, more or less one meter size. We had eight uh, big telescopes. And then uh, when the Richie Critian uh, optical scheme was invented and used, uh, most of Schmidt telescopes were not uh, giving any more big uh, effect. Uh, and Birakan Observatory was among these uh, eight sites, having one meter Schmidt with very efficient work and results by Markarel survey, etc., which, uh, by the way, uh, entered the UNESCO documentary heritage. And finally, I have a slide giving uh, some pros and cons for small, uh, medium, and uh, with big size telescopes. Of course, uh, everybody considers as big telescopes are better, but not always, not, not from any point of view. So collecting area, of course, for big telescopes is better. Uh, for smaller, is poor. Limiting magnitude, the same. So the cost is vice versa. For if regarding the cost, then big telescopes have very high cost and not very uh, easily available or uh, easily made for, by many consortia. And the small can be a lot. Uh, the same, the, the numbers, so the small and medium-sized telescope, we have a lot, which is also uh, useful for, for collaborative observing projects, etc. So observing time pressure, uh, again, for big telescopes, it's not very easy to get observing time, but it's much easier for small and medium-sized telescopes. Number of objects, uh, for smaller telescopes having bigger uh, field of view, uh, we have more objects and uh, big telescopes are mainly used for focused observations, for pointed observations, uh, for definite uh, objects. So they are pointed to definite objects and observed in very details. Mobility, of course, the small telescopes have some mobility, some of them, and you can put, uh, for example, you change the location, you, you can uh, move them into different points. Resolving power, which is characterized by this formula, 
is poor for small ones and good for big ones. Field of view, as I said, is more or less uh, bigger for small ones. The equi equipment is portable for uh, smaller ones and for big ones it is dedicated it is, it, because it was very ex expensive. It is built once in many years, maybe it can be changed or modified. The weight, uh, the same, is uh, the advantage for smaller telescopes. Observing costs, maintenance costs, uh, collaborative projects are many for small telescopes. For example, small and medium uh, medium uh, size telescopes have very good collaboration, Opticon, which is a collaboration of 22 uh, telescopes in the world, and you can uh, share the observing programs, for example, which is a very big advantage. But the big telescopes have fewer collaborations, though they are collaborating with some feeding telescopes. Sometimes you need to pre-select objects for further observation with big telescopes. The software systems, again, it, they are dedicated for big, but there are very many standard softwares for small and medium-sized telescopes. And the robotic mode is still not possible for big ones. Uh, probably in the future, we hope that it will also be possible, but it's, uh, these very expensive devices are not still uh, yet allowed to use in robotic mode. And small and medium-sized telescopes are in robotic, which is a very big advantage because one observer, for example, can run several telescopes simultaneously in different sites in the world and make uh, observations with several programs, observing programs or combination of the same program with several telescopes. So this is a mm, general understanding a picture of uh, our telescopes in the world. And of course, uh, I think the teachers should know and uh, have more or less good understanding of what is the telescope. Because this is the uh, only, let's say, the the main uh, thing device that gives us information coming from the space, uh, along with, of course, theoretical studies. But any theoretical study should be checked and then verified by telescope observations. So the telescope is the astronomer's main instrument, and we should know very uh, well its construction, its possibilities, is, uh, how it, it can be used, and uh, the observing, by the opinion of many obser observer astronomers, is not only science, but also art. So observing is really uh, very important to, uh, to get good results. Thank you very much for this opportunity to give this lecture. Thank you very much, Alec, for your interesting presentation about telescopes. I think it was a point that was not uh, considered before in this meeting, and uh, it is a compliment uh, that uh, the other previous ones. I think that we have a question by Duruti. Yes, please. Uh, not only question, Dobry Vieni, Professor Mikhailian. Nice mm -hmm. to see you again. Uh, I, I think that uh, research on uh, uh, patent archives in Spain developed that, uh, in fact, the first patent was uh, uh, granted to uh, Juan Roguet. I share at the chat the reference in an uh, academic book. And mm -hmm. also, uh, I, I would like to recommend this wonderful book by Mark Bolt, from, uh, uh, was uh, introduced in uh, International Astronomy Year. Uh, he was there in uh, Adler Planetarium at Chicago. Now he's in Corning uh, Museum of glass, and it's a, a quite wonderful book concerning telescopes. Thank you. Uh, I, I share the, the the reference in the in the chat. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your contribution. I don't know if Arek, do you want to mention something more? No. No, actually, there was no question. Excellent. Thank you very much. Oh, well, uh, I would like to give the opportunity to 
Beatriz, maybe, do you want to add some comments? Uh, I just, uh, well, I don't know if uh, anyone here wants to uh, to make any comment or say something about the, about the meeting today, but before of this, as you mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, very early in the morning, um, that the closing session of this activity along the year will be in Argentina. Uh, I would like to introduce, I know that she doesn't want to speak English, but it's the same, doesn't matter. Introduce Graciela Violas, which is here. She is the director of uh, economic promotion in Malarue department. It's a city in Mendoza where we will perform the closing activity of uh, bridges between cultures this year. Graciela, can you turn on your camera? Podes encender tu camera? Um, we'll be in Malarue. Malarue is a nice city, very nice city, where the Piero Che Observatory for the Study of Cosmic Rays of Ultra High Energy is located, but also an amazing place in Mendoza. Graciela is there. Um, we will perform the activity. We don't know exactly the day because remember that October the 2nd, we have an eclipse here in Argentina, annular one in the southern part of the country, in uh, the Patagonia. And the activity for the Messier Challenge will be or before or after, probably after the eclipse in Malarue. So Graciela, thank you very much. She is in charge of uh, one important office in the municipality of uh, Malarue, where we will have the hybrid um, closing ceremony for the challenge. Gracias, Graciela. Well. Yes, good morning or just for everybody, but we are so happy to have this chance, of course, to close uh, this activity in Malarue during October. So Beatriz will be in charge to organize everything. And of course, here in Malarue, we will receive to everybody just in this uh, meeting. We are extremely happy to have this chance uh, to organize everything in our city. So thank you very much to everybody. Congratulations for this meeting. And we will be expecting and organizing everything for this ceremony during October. Thank you very much, Graciela. Thank you, thank you very much, Graciela. We are very happy to have this opportunity. Uh, and we are very happy, especially, to organize the closing session in America and in Argentina. Uh, you are a very special country that you have a collection of eclipses every year. This is not, no, not every year. It's too much. <laughs> I don't it's, know I don't how, know. how do you solve this. <laughs> but thank you. It's a we, wonderful we, opportunity we, we, for <laughs> us. And I hope that we have uh, the opportunity to visit you and to go again to Argentina. And to oh, thank yes, you, you well. of course. Thank you, Graciela. No, thank you to all of you. And we, we will be here expecting just the arrival of all of you in our city, of course. We would like to go, yes. yes. <laughs> OK, well, well, nothing, nothing else from my side. Thank you very much, Graciela. Thank you very much, Rosa, yeah. for the activity and everyone to be here until the end. We didn't lost I would like to say thank meeting. you to all the speakers that they present a very interesting, uh, interesting contributions, and I think it was a pleasure for all of us to listen to them and to participate and to exchange information. And uh, we hope that all of you, I am teacher also, and I give you homework. All of you promote missile challenge in your countries okay we want to receive many many contributions many uh, many votations about the objects for the nasa catalog and uh, we want to prepare an exceptional a wonderful an excellent uh, final meeting final meeting in argentina 
see you again in Argentina in all the places in the world. And uh, thank you for your help, for your contribution, because that's are all of us. Thank you. If you if you turn on the cameras, we will take a last uh, group of vote. Hi, Rosa. Oh, hello, Norali. How are you? <laughs> well, hello, Shibahi. Hello. Uh, yeah, it you. was very nice, very exciting, and, very exciting material. And Karina, Ligia, Mariam, uh, well, a lot of people from different places. If you I'm turn perfect, on the camera. Perfect. Uh, she is from uh, Togo. And Perfect uh, was my my guide in Togo. <laughs> Medar also. I have uh, many. Ah, Ligia, hi. And Monica <laughs> from Mexico. Hello, Monica. Miriam, Mariam from Iran. Uh, Jose Angel from Asia. Venezuela. Uh, Diana. Diana. Diana, would you like to repeat, please, your speech at the beginning because we didn't uh, record it? <laughs> yes, sure. <clears throat> um, I'm here to send greetings on behalf of Anna Noy from Romania which is a mathematics inspector in our national education ministry. We are really delighted to be in this project and we hope to do wonderful things together for our students. Thank you. Thank you. I, I want to go to mention that Elizabeth Anna is promoting very much astronomy in Romania. Thank you. Thank you very much Thank to you. everybody. And I take a wonderful picture as a final picture in this meeting. I took many of them during the session. Thank you very much. See you again. Bye-bye to everybody. Bye-bye to Mariam, Diana, Ligia. Bye-bye. Monica Durruti. Also, Monica. Saludos cordiales. And Jonathan and uh, Rafael. Jose Angel is here. Jamal, no? Jamal, thank you, Durruti. Arek. Thank you very much to everybody and also the people that Adios. don't have to Adios. Also, Ricardo, Adios. we cannot see you. No te vemos, eh, Ricardo? Ahora, ahora sí. Muy bien, Ricardo. Thank you. Ah, Joséín, you are here for the last photo. Only for the photo. Very bad, very bad. <laughs> Can regards to my colleagues in Iran. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you to everybody. Ah, Medar, finally. <laughs> I am happy to see you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to everybody. Uh, Jose Angel. Thank you. And uh, see you the next meeting. Okay? See you and in see October. You face to face, when it will be possible in your countries or our countries. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you for all. Thank, Thank you, Ruti. Every day, every day. Thank you, Jose Angel. Bye bye. Gracias por estar aquí. Merci Muchas gracias. Tu gracias a todos. Thank you. Merci. I don't know if, uh, if there are something from France. No, not yet. Oui, oui. Bye -bye. Madame parle français. Oh, oui. Togo. Merci beaucoup. Au revoir. Au revoir. Au revoir. Au revoir, mon chéri. <laughs> Au revoir. <laughs> Hola, Claudia. Hola, Claudia. <laughs> Hello. Claudia, es el me desocupé y quería al menos verlos por <laughs> el monitor. Disculpen, por okay. favor. Gracias. Gracias por estar aquí. Es difícil en Argentina, lo sabemos. Pero bueno. Intentamos que sea más o menos potable para todo el mundo. Exacto. Sí, ya nos veremos pronto. Gracias. Besos allá en Santa Fe, besos en México, Nicaragua, la gente gracias, que está viendo todavía. En Rumania, Corina. Good luck. Bueno, voy a parar la transmisión ahora. Vale, <risa> chao. Bien. Hasta bye. luego. Chao, chao. Hasta la próxima. See you again. Oh, oh. Bye, bye.